What's up, everybody, and good evening. My name is Ron Sparkman. Uh, on this channel, I'm known as Ron Comet. That's a long and funny story that we will absolutely talk about probably later because everybody's going to mention it in the comments as they usually do. Uh, but tonight, we're actually going to do something a little special. Normally, what we do is we talk about space news, and then we kind of let the conversation guide us as we uh, as we see fit. But so many people have asked about the Aliens episode where we talk about life in the universe. So we're going to take it very seriously and we have um, quite a few doctors, quite a few professionals, and some science communicators like myself and Athena who absolutely love the idea of what's out there. Um, so it's gonna be an incredible conversation. Uh, we're gonna roll for two hours minimum and talk about some really cool stuff. Uh, so first thing I'm gonna do is, uh, Professor Mayo, I'm gonna go to you and give us an introduction, let us know who you are mm -hmm. and your background and all the cool things you were telling me before we got started. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, so I'm Lou Mayo. I'm a professor of astronomy at Marymount University, and I uh, spent about 30 years, uh, over 30 years, at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center working on problems in planetary science. Uh, spent a number of years on the Voyager uh, infrared science team, as well as the Cassini infrared science team. And the, um, the, the, the highlight of all that, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, the, the investigations of Titan which is uh, uh, Earth's true sister planet. Uh, Titan is the most amazing body in the solar system because it's so Earth-like with clouds and seasons and rivers and rain and lakes. And and it does all that at about minus 290 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it's, a, it's an interesting place with possibilities for life. Uh, and I... Uh, so I worked with those teams, worked with some uh, uh, science uh, data centers where NASA stores all of their science data. And I do a lot of uh, education public outreach speaking. So right now I have a uh, uh, contract with the SETI Institute where I'm training Girl Scouts in astronomy and uh, teaching them how to run their own astronomy clubs. And then we send them back out into the diaspora to invite uh, new girls in to teach them the wonders of astronomy. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And actually, uh, somebody we'll have on a future show is the director of education for SLU. And they've been working with, I think, both a boy and Girl Scouts um, to, uh, and they've got a National Science Foundation grant. And, and it's an entire, it's gamification, much like Khan Academy. They do some really cool stuff. So we look forward to having them on in the future. Uh, so Dr. Graham Lau, I'm going to go to you next. Uh, people have I've seen you before more than once. And it's actually because of the conversation that went on that one night with, uh, with Neil and everybody that this show happened. Uh, because it just it got so deep into it so uh graham had to be here so graham tell us a little bit about yourself yeah groovy uh yeah i'm an astrobiologist and science communicator uh, i currently work for blue marble space uh, uh, i do communications and marketing now for blue marble space even though i'm also a research scientist at the blue marble space institute of science uh, i also help to run the university rover challenge in utah every year where undergraduate students from around the world will build mars rovers and bring them out to the desert to compete in a martian environment uh, I have a lot of other roles. I'll be, I'll be a professor with the, the, the first summer program from Mars University. Um, I've done a lot of communication work in my life. I'm a public speaker. I enjoy just talking to people about space and the awesomeness that's out there and asking those questions of whether or not we're alone. And, and I see Imran uh, is, in, is in the Facebook right now watching. He said groovy. And yes, it is groovy. <laughs> uh, it's so cool to learn all these things. And there's always more to learn, more to know. Uh, I started off in a background academically in biology, chemistry, astrophysics, and geology. And now in my life, I, I also do graphic design and speaking and all these other things. And so there's just so much, so many ways for us to explore who and what we are and, and to share that with each other. Wonderful way to intro. Okay, next up, we're going to go to Athena Brensberger, Astro Athens, who was on uh, the crazy live stream we had Monday night with over a thousand concurrent viewers. I think it ended up with something like 14,000 total people watching through that hour that we did. And it was so incredible. We had such a great lineup. I'm so glad that you were able to join us again tonight. So you you dive into a whole lot of things um, from working with uh, Charlie Liu and Neil deGrasse Tyson all the work that you do, your videos are amazing. TikTok star. Uh, so Athena, tell us a little bit about yourself and your awesome new haircut. Well, thank you for, for, for noticing the haircut. Um, yeah, so I started a brand called Astro Athens, which kind of just happened through um, wanting to create content about space science, but in a really like fun, funky, digestible way, um, where I first off relate a, like the cup of coffee of the day to a new discovery in astrophysics. And then it kind of just grew from there. And so um, 
yeah, as you mentioned, TikTok um, doing like DIY experiments um, with like students um, to maybe get extra credit in their science class and um, coming up with, yeah, just new ways to really explore astrophysics. So um, I definitely am a science communicator, focuses on astrophysics because that's what I was studying back at university, um, specifically proplids, so protoplanetary disks. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about the SETI Institute because that was a big goal of mine later on was to actually pursue radio astronomy and go more into um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So um, it was really cool. I got to hear Dr. Frank Drake speak at the International Space Development Conference. And oh man, I'm so excited to get into the Drake equation today. I hope we do. Um, so, oh, we have yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. Drake and Fermi. We got to talk about the Drake uh, uh, the Drake equation, the Fermi paradox. Um, yeah. Those will definitely be things. And also the possibility that there's absolutely no life in the universe other than ours. There's going to be that. It's something that Graham always loves to bring up because of how important it is to him to say, we have to, as scientists and, and science lovers, uh, space evangelists say, maybe we are alone. And uh, still one of my all-time favorite quotes, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, next up. Ryut, how's it going? And so we're so glad to have you. So she is in Israel. It's five o'clock in the morning and she still decided to join us because she's just that amazing. And uh, we love her for it. So uh, doctor, please tell us about you and all the amazing things you do. And uh, let's go. You are muted. There you go. Yeah, you know, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., who cares? Everything is fine. So uh, my name is Ryut Sorek Abramovich. I have a PhD in microbiology and immunology. I'm an astrobiologist for the past, you know, whatever years. Um, uh, I do extreme environment. I did some field trips in Australia with some NASA folks. I studied stromatolite a lot. And today what I do is, so I sort of... Um, I have two NGOs that I uh, work with and I, I co-founded. One was the Israeli, Mars the Israeli Mars chapter and the other one is, a, is a, an NGO called uh, DMARS, which is Desert Mars, um, which is uh, the Desert Mars Analog Research Station in which we do analog missions in Israel in the Ramon Crit, a beautiful area, very much like Mars. And uh, so I'm a, also a science communicator now. I work with high school students and I train them as astronauts for a year and a half and then they go through this analog mission and it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, I also have been to several, like, I'm a public speaker in international, uh, in all sorts of international places. <laughs> I'm a co-lecturer for the International Space University, and I'm very, very happy to be here today. We're so glad to have you. Thank you for getting up so early. So she was going to stay up late. So the show was going to start in like midnight for her. And she's like, no, it's not midnight. It's five o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to go to bed and get up early with six cups of coffee. So uh, we're, we're so thrilled to have you. Uh, next up is somebody, again, uh, uh, Professor Mayo and Dr. Dworkin, I met just today whenever I asked my Facebook family. Um, that's one of the reasons I love Space Fam. It's one of the reasons it's called that is whenever I'm missing a person or need somebody else. Um, they always come through. So we ended up adding more people. So Dr. Jason Dworkin does amazing work for NASA. I will let him tell you the whole thing because he's working on some pretty cool stuff. Uh, Dr. Dworkin, please uh, let us let us know about who you are and what you do, sir. Well, thanks. So um, I was interested in origin of life from a very young age. I actually got involved in exobiology, uh, as was called then, research in high school in uh, like 1984 or 83. I don't remember. Um, and so uh, doing uh, chemistry of uh, the origin of life research, uh, then PhD in biochemistry, got back into origin of life work, uh, worked at uh, NASA Ames, uh, funded through the SETI Institute actually, doing chemistry to understand uh, the origin of life aspect of the Drake equation. And then was hired at uh, NASA Goddard, um, where I'm currently the senior scientist for astrobiology. I run a laboratory studying uh, meteorites and other uh, extraterrestrial samples and, and their analogs uh, for organic compounds relevant to life. Uh, and I'm also the uh, project scientist for the Osiris Rex mission, which will be getting a sample from asteroid Bennu in 45 days to bring back to Earth for the world to study. I mean, seriously, it's an incredible panel. We have one more person coming on just in a little bit. He is on his way back. It's uh, Maynard Okereke from Hip Hop Science, who's just an incredible science communicator, reaching out to a lot of great communities. Such a fun guy. He was actually on the show with us a couple weeks ago, but only for a piece of it. He was supposed to be one of the main panelists, but we've got so much to talk about. So let's just go ahead and get it out of the way. Um, 
there's been so much in the news recently, especially New York Times, everyone saying we're seeing things in the night sky. There's things that we don't know about. And everybody's, and everybody's trying to equate UFOs to aliens. Just because it's an unidentified flying object does not mean that there's something something here that's looking for us or whatever. But it also, the possibilities are out there. So let's let's cut through that real quick. Is there anybody in particular that wants to jump in about what they have thought about it? Because it's coming from a lot of professional sources. It's coming from the Pentagon and so on. Is there anybody that would like to raise their hands and go first on this one? Okay, Graham. Yeah, I'll jump in first. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's always going to be things that we don't understand, right? Uh, we're curious. We're, we're a curious species. We have been. It's what has driven us to explore more and to develop science and to learn more about our place in the cosmos. But science doesn't explain everything. And so certainly there are things we cannot explain. And when it comes to, uh, you say UFO, unidentified flying object, uh, a newer, maybe more hip term now is unidentified aerial phenomenon, uh, a UAP, because not all of these things are necessarily objects. Maybe maybe they're light. UOP doesn't have quite the same ring, does it? Uh, doesn't, doesn't sound, <laughs> yeah. A UOPologist is going to come along here sometime soon, I guess. <laughs> I mean, but, I see, um, right? But, you know, there, there are things that we can't explain. And so I've seen things at night in the sky that I personally can't explain. I've seen lights move in weird ways. But when it comes down to it, there, there is a lot of those things that we, we can explain scientifically, or at least we can hypothesize scientifically about a natural physical process that could make it happen. And for the very small number of things that we, we don't really know uh, how to explain it, that still doesn't mean it's aliens, right? And so what I always say logically, if you think aliens are coming to visit us now, uh, then why are they so bad at doing what they want to do? If they, if they have the technology to travel through inter stellar space to travel light years to come visit other worlds and their main goal for whatever reason is to hide themselves from us then why are they so bad at doing it uh you, you'd think that if they have that technology they, they wouldn't get caught so often um and so that, that that to me logically just makes it seem like it just can't be aliens um but still the, the truth is we just don't know uh and actually a, a colleague of mine at the blue marble space institute of science jacob hawk misra uh and one of his colleagues uh, wrote an article in Scientific American that came out, I think it was like two weeks ago, uh, basically arguing that, you know, what, what we scientists do when we have a phenomenon occurring that we don't understand, uh, even if there is a large fringe group of people out there who are, who are throwing, you know, potentially, you know, questionable ideas at what it might be, we still do the research. We still try and study it. We still try to figure it out. And so with UAP or UFOs, if you will, what we should do is study them. Why not? Why, why not try to figure it out? Why, why not spend some time trying to figure out what these things are? Maybe we won't figure it out, or maybe we'll discover some some new thing about, about the, the heavens above, about the atmosphere, about the way that light interacts with the clouds. I mean, there's there's all kinds of things that could we could learn from that. And so my argument is that it's probably not aliens, but it's worth looking into. Fair enough. And uh, just real quick, we do have Maynard, the man myth himself, uh, who just came back from the beach. Um, look, looking spiffy, looking awesome. So uh, glad, I'm glad to have you What's here, up, man. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> pleasure to, pleasure Great to, to see you, man. Great to see you. For the first time, and some of you have seen through social media, like Athena. What up, what up? <laughs> um, well, just real quick, before we continue the question that we have going on right now, if you just want to give a quick breakdown about the cool things you do, and uh, then we'll go kind of from there. Okay. Well, sorry, I'm late. I was here enjoying the beautiful beaches of Los Angeles, California on, 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 a, on a Saturday uh, evening. But uh, what's up, everybody? I am Maynard O'Karake, also known as the Hip Hop MD. Uh, I have a platform called Hip Hop Science, where I basically use music, entertainment, pop culture to educate people on various scientific subjects. And I touch on everything from space to natural sciences to chemistry, physics, whatever scientific, you name it. And uh, me and Rod have been connecting for the past few months, and he's been awesome. He always plugs me with dope stuff going on, and I've always been a big fan of stardom and of his. And a uh, big shout out, actually, we got it. We're, we're, we're amongst greatness. The man got to uh, interview Elon Musk, so I'm just happy to be part of this amazing group tonight. Man, we're glad to have you. And I talked to Bill Nye, and he said, if you say that uh, it's, you are Bill Nye meets a world, uh, world star, 
Um, he probably will have to come out after you. So just want to let you know, man. He wasn't. I'm just kidding. He didn't say anything. At all. <laughs> but I love that. That's that's his mix where he says he's Bill Nye meets World Star, and it's that fun. It's that mixture of music. And he and I have talked about it before. My background in music, DJing, and the things that I've done, and then um, the way I was able to take um, my the MC skills and be able to take it to, in, into science communication. He does the same thing with. Um, his acting career and uh, and the, the love he has for hip hop and then science communication and the science background. So let's get back to the question is that um, that we're talking about right now is basically uh, there's been a lot that's been out there recently that um, at least the U S government has been directly saying there's things we don't understand. And Graham was saying, maybe it's this it's probably not, but we can't, it, we can't, say those are not possibilities. So is there anybody else that wants to jump in? Uh, Ryu, you have a smile on your face, so I can't wait to hear what you have to say. And unmute. There you yeah, go. yeah, yeah, it's all the th The only thing I wanted to add to, to what Graham said, which I, I basically agree with, is that, you know, probably your audience knows or doesn't know, but like in the next five years, there are going to be between eight to 10,000 new satellites in the sky, right? We have the Starlink by SpaceX and we have other um, quite a lot of launches headed up for nanosatellite and small satellites. So I'm going to guess that people are going to see a lot more things happening in the sky and twinkling here and there and looking information like this or not, because some of these uh, networks of satellites are going to have like this specific clusters configuration. So I'm thinking this is going to be just, you know, much more fun for us and for the public to spot up whatever is happening out there. And uh, yeah, maybe like when you have like a flight tracker, maybe you need like a UFO tracker and then, you know, you have the app and you can say, hey, wait, is this UFO? Is it part of a satellite or not? Is it something else? And you can report it to a main database. I mean, why not? That's super awesome. I mean, let's figure it out. Let's actually go through the, the scientific method and say we have we have went through everything else and there, there's still this thing that we have in our mind that we don't know what this is. And that's, that's the whole fun of this is that with, with certain, there's certain things that we have in culture that stop us from ever continuing to ask the question. But science always says you always want to continue to whittle it down and whittle it down and whittle it down. And uh, Dr. Dorkin, I saw that you were shaking your head a little bit. Anything you want to add to that? No, no. I mean, in a good way. Agreeing, yeah, yeah. Agreeing that, um, uh, to, to, to go from UFOs or something that's unidentified to therefore must be aliens is quite a leap. That's, um, uh, you know, the $10 word, that's not the most parsimonious explanation. But absolutely understand what the phenomenon is. And geez, if it is aliens, that'd be fantastic. I want to understand how their chemistry works. That'd be great. Uh, but, uh, and as Graham said, if they, if they are aliens, intelligent aliens visiting us, um, it's hard to understand why you would have um, them doing either a bad job communicating with us uh, or a bad job hiding. So it's 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 kind of the worst of both worlds. And so, yeah, I, I agree with what Graham said. Well, I mean, okay, so, yeah, uh, Lou, uh, let, let's go to you. Yeah, just a word of caution, guys. Uh, I want to hark back to uh, early 1600s when Giordano Bruno, he, Contemporary of Galileo's uh, got speculated. absolutely murdered for thinking. He that. got murdered for, <laughs> for for talking like this. So I want to be careful. Um, right around that time, we started to understand that the physics of Earth was not different than the physics of the heavens. It wasn't the pristine heavens and the uh, unwashed masses on Earth. The physics was pretty much the same in all places. Uh, and so, if we take the physics and the chemistry and the biology that we know here on Earth and we uh, start to play some games with it, such as uh, populate a um, canister in a laboratory with an atmosphere very much like Titans and give it a little electricity, give it a little jazz to get, get uh, chemistry going, we can produce amino acids. Uh, so I think there's every reason to suspect that there is life out there. Um, in the words of Jodie Foster from the movie Contact, Yes. if there isn't, it's an awful lot of wasted space. Uh, I would just uh, say that we proceed uh, thoughtfully and uh, cautiously, as Carl Sagan said, incredible claims require incredible evidence. And I suspect, and the word uh, uh, attended a talk by Jim Green uh, not, not too long ago, where he um, speculated that within the next five years or so, uh, we will uh, find evidence of life outside the earth. So I think that's an, an exciting possibility. 
Well, and it's funny that you mentioned that one of my uh, most recent interviews for Mars Society's Red Planet Radio. Um, I think that's the one I did it for. I can't remember now. I don't remember which one it was. I do so many shows now, I forget. But um, I was talking to Jim Green. And, and wait, hold on a second. Jim's so great. Wait, He's, he does feel good that? after you talk to Jim. Jim is Jim's the best. Yeah, and that's exactly what it was. So we got him about a week after he said that. And, uh, well, I'm sorry. We actually had set it up. And it took about a month and a half to set it up. So it was the week after he said that. And our, con- our conversation went into that. And that is a big point of topic that we're going to go into later. Say that we do find it in the next five years and what that's going to mean. So that's going to be a topic we're going to hit on because there's so much we have to talk about for the show. Um, but Athena, I want to go to you real quick and see, like, you know, what do you think about what you see? And go a little extra long because Ron's going to get a tasty beverage. <laughs> You're going to go get a beverage. Nice. Um, also, I love that comment from someone who said that Ron is like the Jimmy Fallon of space. I totally agree with that. Thank um, you, uh, Lee Giot. I from, feel like uh, the first question I... No, go ahead. Lee Giot was the one that was? gave you that name. Yeah, yeah, Lee Giot <laughs> did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's so appropriate. Um, yeah, the first thought that I have is who's to say an actual flying object is an alien what if the like actual you know extraterrestrial intelligence out there communicate in a completely different way almost a non-physical way what if it's actually sent through you know like we were saying earlier i think graham actually mentioned that that if it would if they were communicating through light or through radio waves or through not an actual physical flying object but instead i think more like the movie the arrival like what if their language is totally different what if time is seen as different that's what I ask when I think about, you know, alien life, life beyond Earth. Um, that's one of like the biggest things. Um, but then I, when I think about what I see in the night sky, um, I actually had this crazy dream last night about um, the SpaceX launches. And the first time I ever saw um, stage separation of a Falcon 9 rocket was on Venice Beach, California. Completely forgot there was actually a launch that night. I usually track the launches. And all of a sudden the sky is like glowing. And I was like, I recognize that because I've seen SpaceX launches before, but you hear like all these people on Venice beach being like, oh my goodness, there's aliens in the sky. And um, I'm like recording it. And then I just get into a bunch of conversations with like random bystanders saying, hey, no, that's actually a rocket launch from SpaceX. It shot out of Vandenberg Air Force Base and it's going into the sky and they burn through all their fuel. And so they separate that part of the rocket to return to earth. Really that cool. nebula. A nebula, oh, nebula, right? That nebula, that yeah, nebula really awesome. that looks like in the sky is gorgeous. It's incredible, yeah. And um, so when you see stuff like that, you're like, whoa, like aliens? Um, but it's so astonishing. So that, that's really where, where my mind is at as far as like, you know, if there were, if there was alien life out there that's trying to communicate with us, maybe it's not going to be in the form of what we're used to seeing, which is when things arrive, we see airplanes, we see, you know, like actual objects, aircraft, maybe it's not going to be like that, you know? So, which ties into some discrepancies I feel is actually in the the Drake equation, which looks at biological life as we understand on earth. What about, you know, extremophiles? What about possibly, you know, yeah, exactly. Going dormant and then coming back to life. So those are my thoughts. Drake equation is looking for techno signatures. And so we we need to be, um, uh, really careful. So as, as Lou said, uh, yeah, amino acids, they're all over the place. We study them all the time. Uh, they're, ver- they're very easy to, to make uh, astrophysically. Um, going from amino acid to life or trumophiles is a big jump. Going from that to, a, to technology is another big jump. And so when we start talking about uh, aliens visiting the earth, uh, that's not the kind of, of life that Jim Green was talking about in the next five years. We're, we're looking at, and most astrobiologists are looking for chemical signatures of microbial life, uh, uh, living or, or perhaps uh, past life on either the solar system or uh, signatures of, of, uh, of life in exoplanets. It's, so it's a wonderful. For, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go, no, go on. Oh, no, no. I mean, I, and before we bounce to the next part, because I kind of want to go into the more realistic thing of what we're really looking for is Maynard. Uh, so I love what you do uh, on your Instagram page. You'll take news that's out there and you'll kind of break it down. And you have like the paper that you do as you go through it. Is this something that you have do- dove into? Because it's hard to keep up with all the cool stuff you're doing. Um, is that something that you said, hey, listen, this is in the news. Did you cover that? Have you seen anything about it? What do you think about what we're hearing where 
we're not talking about this on a Joe Rogan podcast anymore. We're talking on, about this on a real podcast called Space Fam. Is this the real deal now? Is this something that you're excited about? Yeah. Well, for me, and I think uh, a lot of it has to tie in with what Athena brought up. Uh, she brought up a lot of good points. And I think when we talk about finding life, and discovering life in outer space, a lot of times you know, we make that connection to what we've seen in sci-fi, right? And I think our original uh, thought process is to, we got to discover this intelligent life and this intelligent life is going to look just like us, move just like us or have limbs and, you know, or be violent and have you know, emotions and different things like that, right? But I, I think a little bit more complex, right? I think how life evolved, right? If we look at the biological side, the biological aspect, um, and I can remember somebody brought that up a little bit earlier, but starting from microbial life and then continuing to evolve and shape and form structures and vertebrae and bones and different things like that, right? Um, if we look at just evolution of life, how life has evolved, sometimes if we're looking at life that's been in distant planets, um, that evolution could have been a completely different way. You know, there could be life that's more microbial, that's more of like the tardigrade life, that's also intelligent. Like who knows how that life process evolved or how where the brain has evolved and neuron processing has evolved. Maybe that could have been more compacted into a smaller microbial organism. And it doesn't need to be an organism with a large brain like we see of as being deemed of as smart, whether it be humans or computers monkeys now. or apes. Yep, exactly. I mean, we are I mean, we know Elon Musk has this company that's, you know, going to be connecting our brains into um, uh, basically into a, a supercomputer, uh, super right? Um, and you just think about the abilities and the possibilities that are out there to be able to connect neurons and just think about uh, the technology that took us on to the, to the moon. 50 years later now, we have that same technology right here on our smartphones. So we know that, things, that we know that we can create technology that could be this small. Why not the same way with life? Why couldn't life have evolved to now not need to have a large uh, structure or a large form to be intelligent or be able to have that type of processing power? So those are the type of out of box things that I see. And I think that's why it's so important for all of us as science communicators. Um, and if Peter brought up a good point, right? You see a SpaceX launch and somebody that might not be familiar with the launch and sees that immediately goes to, oh, we have alien life out there. And a lot of times it's just the where it's all and not knowing what's going on in the world of science, not knowing what's happening with, with launches, not knowing what's happening with space travel and all these different things, or just even natural life because there's natural phenomenons that exist with electricity and dust storms and things like that, that could happen in the air that may come off as being a form of life or alien life, you know? So I think it's important for us to really showcase all the different wonders that this world exists or that exist in this world that now the people have a better understanding of can now be able to interpret it properly. I mean, wonderful points there. And I think there's so much that we can talk about. I mean, one of the big ones that's, uh, that I found out about recently was quantum biology, where it's the idea that chemistry over deep time turns into biology. It's that's eventually that, that makes enough sense that eventually you would get to that point through deep time. Some we'll talk about later, but let's talk about, so the main one right now that everybody's talking about obviously is perseverance. Perseverance is on the way to Mars. Um, it's, it's looking for life. It's looking for, there's a few different things like the Moxie, uh, like Moxie and so on. But, when Jim is talking about that, as, as Dr. Dworkin was talking about, Jason said that, you know, that's what he's, that's what he's talking about uh, with the instruments that are on there. What if we find something that's there? So let's go to anybody that wants to talk about it. And Graham, I know that you and I have talked about it before and we went to you first last time, but anybody else that wants to jump in on it is what is perseverance's, uh, what are the tools on that? The, uh, the machinery that's on it, what's it looking for? that if they got it back, Dr. Jim Green would get on NASA TV and probably all TV and say, we have truly found what looks like life. We need to send humans there to do the next level of it. And can perseverance truly prove life with this mission? I don't think I've asked anybody that before. So is there anybody that wants to start with that? Sure. So I'm, I'm doing some, some work on the Mars um, sample return campaign. Uh, and the best thing about perseverance, in my opinion, is that it, it will be having uh, the ability to drill samples and collect them and bring them back to the Earth to study in the best laboratories on Earth. Um, uh, spacecraft uh, are, are amazing things. It's a technological marvel uh, to have these rovers. Uh, they're designed to be small, lightweight, low power, uh, very robust things. Uh, this is not what you need to really detect 
to the tech life. You need uh, big equipment that's hard to maintain, uh, that uh, is a massive laboratory. You need the best laboratories on earth to, uh, to distribute the samples and look at, uh, looking for things like um, uh, chemical evidence of, uh, of chiral accesses, of uh, spatial distributions of, of materials layering or, 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 or structures, uh, isotopic evidence, uh, and uh, chemical distribution or even microfossils. Uh, so these are things that are very, very hard to do on, another, on, on a robotically on another planet. It's much, much better, much more powerful to bring it back to Earth and study it. That's the way to do it, and that's the best thing about perseverance. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, doc, uh, Professor May, I think it's uh, you next. You Jason, look excited. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. We need to bring this stuff back. Uh, it, it's a, a bit of a, a strange situation that uh, Mars 2020 isn't going to bring those canisters back. We'll wait for another Mars mission. But I want to point out that, um, as, as, as I'm sure the panel knows, back in 1976, we landed two Voyager, uh, sorry, uh, Viking spacecraft on Mars. And they had a number of instruments such as gas chromatograph and label released experiments that were designed to in fact detect life. Um, uh, since then, we've been looking for habitable environments or the possible presence of ancient fossil life or something. But uh, that, that those two spacecraft actually tried to detect life. And if you talked to the principal investigators of at least those two experiments on board, where they took dirt out of the Martian soil, put it in a canister, warmed it up, added some water and, and nutrients, and uh, tried to see whether gas was being exchanged. Is there something in there? Are there microbes breathing in the canister? And then the idea would be to heat the canister up very hot if they found results the first time, hopefully kill whatever's in there, which is not nice to the Martians. I, I want to say that up front. Uh, and then see if uh, they get the same results. And if they don't, they say, okay, we found life. And if they do, they say, well, it was just chemistry. Those results uh, from the Viking missions, um, I mean, no one's gonna stick their neck out except for the PIs of those instruments and say we found life on Mars, but they were inconclusive at best. Uh, in some cases, they got positive results. In some cases, they got negative results from an instrument that got negative results uh, for life in the soil of Earth when it was being tested before flight. So it's possible, it's possible that we in fact have already discovered life on Mars. We've heard it a few just, times, haven't we? And we just need to verify it. So I don't, I'm not clear why we are not uh, trying to improve these uh, experiments uh, so that they are more consistent, more reliable, and sending oh, them. We actually are. Numbers. Oh, Jason's got something yeah, to throw yeah. in there. Jason, yeah. hit us. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, one of the things, we've, so the label re release experiment, that had some suggestive results, which, which puzzled people for a long, long time. And the gas chromatograph experiment you mentioned had negative results. It looked like contamination. It was then, uh, uh, then it was discovered that uh, there was a powerful oxidant on Mars. Uh, which was confirmed by the, uh, by the Phoenix lander that landed uh, near the northern pole area. And it found out there's, that there's fairly high levels of uh, perchlorate, which is a strong oxidizer used in rocket fuel, in fact, or uh, our fireworks. Um, and if I understand that right, perchlorate is not only, it's, it's something that is toxic to us, but it's also something that will end up being uh, a resource for us too once we get there. That's possible, and that, yeah. that's an ISRU yeah. aspect. Uh, that's resource utilization. Um, and then the uh, Curiosity rover has has a much better mass spectrometer, much better gas chromatograph. And they found out that when you when you do a heating experiment with this perchlorate in the soil, with uh, all the organics get chlorinated, which looks like the same contamination that was seen on Viking. So possibly there were organic compounds that Viking saw. But because the way it was analyzed, it looked like contamination. So this gives hope that maybe there was a biosignature, or at least um, uh, there should be organic compounds, which have been detected by Perseverance, uh, sorry, by, uh, by Curiosity, a number of, of, uh, of compounds, which should be expected because there's a meteoritic infall. And so organic compounds should be present, doesn't mean that there's biology. But absolutely. And so that's why we want to do these better, better uh, experiments. 
that's why I want to bring samples back. And Perseverance uh, isn't capable of doing that, just capable of drilling it. It's designed to be a multi-mission campaign just because it is so complicated and so hard. We want to be very, very careful that we do not introduce Earth biology to Mars and ruin our experiments or introduce yep. Martian pathogens to Earth and ruin our ecosystem. That, that was a big cop, uh, topic for us. Uh, yeah, no, we, we mean just one second, but it's something that we actually mentioned this week during the Humans to Mars Summit was planetary protection and how important that is, is that we do that. And, uh, you know, so Dr. Alan Stern was on, a few other people were discussing how important it is that we do that. And like, every, if, you, if you've never seen these rooms where they build these rovers and what they do, everybody is shrink wrapped. Like, it's the cleanest clean room you'll ever see. And it's amazing. Uh, Ray, Not good please, enough. But, but, but even but even then they're not that. Okay, well, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's, exactly. Let's Can I first. say something? Please. Can I say yeah, of course. Something? Yeah, Thank you. first, and then we'll so go to It's about Grant. exactly this. Yeah, I just did did some work about this topic about cross contamination. That's how it's called. So I have two different things to say. But at the moment, what I want to say is, first of all, these rooms are not entirely clean. They're not sterile. There's no way to get absolute sterility whatsoever. And we have realized that a, a few years ago. Basically, you know, you have bacillus, you have other things. They piggyback these machines and they go to Mars and they go to the moon and we know they're there. So if we're doing any kind of really, really sensitive analysis, one of the things that we know is astrobiologists who work on drills and works on ships and works in oceans and whatnot is that we are really, really good at detecting when we have like uh, contamination that's coming from the machine or the tool that we're using into our samples. OK, so we're getting really, really good at detecting those minute differences. And one of the things I recently did in the research, which is exactly on this point, is that I actually went and did an analog mission. I sort of had this experiment going on, which basically took the human crew and uh, I would check the cross contamination. What will the with which tools and how will the astronauts or the analog astronauts, when they go out, what kind of things do they introduce to the environment? And because we were in a hyper arid environment that never been characterized before, I was able to take samples from different areas around the astronauts habitat, but then further going on. And so checking along a time frame to see if there's some sort of contamination going back and forth spreading. Is there like a common species, which is really hard from the environment that goes into the habitat? So we are going to publish these results pretty soon. And that's one of the beauties that you can do with analog missions here on Earth is that you can do these type of cross-contamination examination. You know in advance there's no such thing as sterile, as a complete sterility. So my idea is to have like this monitoring system going in. So you're not just testing the environment for the first time. You're testing yourself. You know what you bring with you from planet Earth, whether it's on the walls or on the gloves or through breathing or in your filter in your atmospheric conditions inside the habitat or your spaceship. And then from that on, it's a sort of like a reference point to what you're probably not going to see in the environment. That's not just going to happen. You're not going to find a bacillus. I mean, there's literally like really minute probability that a bacillus came from a meteorite that struck Mars and was able to survive and be exactly at the pinpoint when you're sending your men or doing your sampling with your newly established robot. So this the topic of cross-contamination is absolutely fascinating to me. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And uh, I'm really looking forward. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm saying yes, of course. Absolutely speak. This is what, <laughs> that's, the whole, <laughs> that's the whole reason this show is two hours plus long. It's because no. we, we talk about stuff like this. So yo, go ahead. Yeah, and the second thing I wanted to say, and that was before before we hit on the cross contamination and the co contamination issues, is that um, I used to work on stromatolites in Shark Bay, which was a mind blowing experience for me to understand the geobiology and how life perhaps started here on planet Earth. And one of the things I'm really, 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 really looking forward to is preservance in the Yezero crater where it lands. There's a slight yep. chance that it will find, or at least take a nice photo of stromatolite layers. It usually can look like layers or like little hills um, inside the rock uh, layers. So I'm really looking forward to see if anything like that happens. Uh, stromatolites are very rich in their chemical and in their biosignature. And we have good data here from planet Earth, from Canada, from Australia, from China, from other places. And I think we will have something much more real to talk about if we do get those pictures and we get those samples um, the drill samples that uh, Graham was, I'm um, sorry, that uh, Jason was talking about. And, and that's going to take us like really close to understanding if like 3 billion years ago, uh, did Mars have something similar happening to it? Like we know 
we think we know, <laughs> but we speculate yeah. today and yeah. we probably much know what happened with planet Earth at that time. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I totally agree, by the way, that there's a limit to what rovers can do. And especially from a biological point of view, it's just there's so many more tools that needs to be applied and really a lot of tests to make sure there's no cross contamination and things like that. So, yeah. So the preservance, stromatolites, Yezero crater and cross contamination. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. We're, we're so, and, um, agreement. What was that? What was that, Jason? I think we're in violent agreement. Well, we're, I think everybody's um, in violent agreement here. Well, and one of the yeah. things I want to do, if I can, Jason, for just a moment, is that Graham was about to talk to. Let me go to him. I'll go right to you, sir. Well, I was just going to say that the clean rooms are not that clean. But, uh, Ryut, I, I think I should introduce you to Jen Keith. Uh, she's an intern at NASA Ames and yeah, a, she's a research wonderful. associate uh, with mm -hmm. our organization. And she just gave a really awesome talk yesterday to the Network for Life Detection that kind of blew my mind a little bit. Uh, so she's been doing research and it's not published, so I don't want to steal her fire too much here, but she gave a really cool talk. Uh, they've been using atmospheric modeling to model how the leakage of our cells and our biological material from our habitats when we get to Mars uh, will spread around Mars, thus making life detection after humans get there far more difficult for us. Uh, and so the two of you should definitely talk since it sounds like you've done a lot of research using analog stations as well. And now she has the modeling uh, from atmospheric chemistry. Those things could really work well, really well together for us to know whether or not sending humans to Mars will then very much limit our ability to look for life at the surface of Mars. Um, uh, Jason, and then we'll go to you, Athena. Yes, no, that, that actually is, uh, is a concern of having uh, private companies go to Mars is what's that, what's that to do for future science. And uh, uh, yeah, agreement all over the place. Uh, the only thing I would disagree with that's been said is that uh, looking at stromatolites by eye is very, very difficult. There's a lot of other later structures that are abiotic, uh, even on Earth, that have been thought to be stromatolites that turn out to be crystal structures. Uh, so, but uh, looking, looking for stromatolites is fantastic. I'm jealous you went to Sharks Bay. I'd love to see, go there. Um, uh, clean rooms are clean with respect to particles, which is not the same thing as being clean with respect to organics, which is not the same thing as being clean with respect to life. And so uh, we also have a paper, we characterize the uh, various Osiris Rex assembly rooms over the course of the mission construction and uh, did uh, multi-genomic, multi-genera uh, uh, sequencing and hopefully have that coming out soon. But yeah, it's not a it's not a biology free environment because people are filthy. <laughs> they absolutely are. So what I want to go to next, I want to go to Athena and then Maynard is that as the psychoms, as we talk to these people that are absolute experts in this, how we're going to be able to take this and share this out to the public. It's already exciting the way it is, but Athena say that all these pieces kind of come together and we, we one, it's something we have to get out to the public is that we may still, even as, as hard as people are working, some things might get screwed up. Some things might happen. And there's going to be so many places we can look at. We've barely, no pun intended, curiosity and insight, scratch the surface of what is Mars. So uh, imagine all these pieces come together. Athena, um, what what do you think about making sure that people understand this? Well, like if now that you hear it, I know that you like you just keep saying, I'm taking notes, I'm taking notes. How are you going to share this with people? And then Maynard, I'm going to go to you. Crazy. Yeah, I've actually been exploring that as, I mean, I wish you guys could see how long my notes are right now. This is so incredible. I hope everyone who's watching is also like taking really fun notes about this. The first thing I think about is, okay, how can I make this relatable to, um, I guess, like people, like, like people on a playground, for instance, like trying to understand, I guess, the concept of like, I don't know, play, play I, I'm trying to, I guess, put different things together. The one thing I focus on as a science communicator is taking a lot of like the notes I'm taking right now, a lot of this bulk and finding it, finding a way, I guess, to kind of make it as down to earth and relatable as possible. And for us, we might think this is totally relatable. This we're talking about like our cells leaking out of things and, you know, possibly contaminating other things. And then, you know, making sure that those um, contaminations aren't what we're actually seeing on Mars and being able to pinpoint all that, like everything that Root was saying, was was so incredible because those are the details that I think a lot of times um, I think people aren't so used to or aware of that all these little tiny details are what goes into the science that 
astrobiologists are working on, that developers of Mars rovers are working on, all these little things, but it it all adds up to the grander scheme of things. Um, so for me, something that stood out the most that I actually wrote a question as, I believe it was when Jason was speaking, um, he was saying that even when these, it was re regarding to um, testing out, uh, I think it was about like testing out like, um, if whether or not you could detect life on Mars. And it said you got negative results in the soil on Earth. And I literally put that as a question. I'm like, it got negative results on the soil on Earth? Like what? Yeah, yeah, that was Lou's comment. I wasn't sure about that. Okay, I, I would love to- Lou said that, I, I didn't know about that. That's, that. See now that I think really, I bolded it because it was so in interesting to me. And um, that really goes to show, I think also, like I'm gonna research that more um, and kind of look into that. So thank you for sharing that. I think that's that's an example of how, you know, sometimes with with science, like there will be different results, and it's about figuring out what led to that result, and then why we may be getting those results elsewhere. And so, trying to translate that, I mean, I'm I'm literally still putting together like the painting in my head. Usually, by the time I'm on I'm on camera, I'm like, yeah, I got all of it together. So right now, it's I think trying to trying to put all that together. But I mean, this is just I think. Really, I think it could be a huge wake up call for, uh, I think, a lot of people to kind of recognize like what really goes into all these missions. And as you guys were saying before, um, I'll reiterate again, that's why these rovers are in a series. It's a whole series of missions that go to Mars because it's about constant testing with new tools and new instruments. And this also shows the importance of why humans have to go because to have that that human ability to be able to physically be there, work on things, bring it right away inside of either, whether it's a Martian base or just inside a space spacecraft that's landed or a lander. Um, that in itself, I think we'll be able to derive so much more information than you know, a robotic mission. So yeah, I, I think that this is just gonna be so exciting by the time we start to see humans on Mars. Maynard, you're a total nerd like I am, man. I know you got to be, I know you got some thoughts in your head right now, man. Uh, share a little bit with us, Ben. I know you're doing the same thing. Unmute yourself, by the way. You are muted. And I appreciate that for you, for you doing it, but hit us, man. Yeah, yeah I know I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking uh, diligent notes here as well, because, you know, everybody's bringing up really good points and really, and you know, we talked about how we tie this back into science communication and really what i what i like to do you know because a lot of this is you know we're all learning as we're going right space is a is, is a constant uh whirlwind of discovery we're all learning things constantly and as a science communicator i'm learning so many different things about uh discoveries that we're making uh interstellar and and uh and especially with the mars that we're talking about right now with perseverance and i think as science communicator what i always try to do is tie things back to what we know or what we've seen here on earth or examples that we have with either the natural sciences and natural world, whether it be areas of conservation, whether it be talking about ethics. Um, and, you know, I'll, 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 I'll go in here because this kind of my nerd mind goes, but, you know, sci-fi always sparks from, from conversations that we have about certain things like this, right? So if we look at, like, my favorite movie, Jurassic Park, right? Wait, 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 hold on. If, if you love back, the movie, you know, then you the need to read both the books. Because seriously, that's what made <laughs> me almost a paleontologist. And honestly, I won't <laughs> lie. Would not the coolest job title in the world be the astro paleontologist, someone that goes to Mars to find the extinct life there? Astro Sorry, go ahead, man. But I just, uh, I got my nerd heart beats even mm -hmm. faster when we mix yeah. the two together. Yeah, no, exactly. And and we and we think about that, right? We think about like Jurassic Park, right? And the tech, what they're doing with DNA testing. And, you know, the, the famous quote is in there is like, we spent so much time trying to, see if we could do it, we didn't ask if we should do it, right? And I think in a way that ties into what we talk about when we talk about discovering life on other planets, right? Because we're so focused on, is there life out there? Where can we find life? Habitable zones, water on other planets, right? We spend so much time like, what, where can we find life? And but I don't know if we've really dove into the question of what do we actually do when we yep. find it? Like if we are on Mars and we discover like if once Perseverance lands and a month later, there's you know, the camera crosses, you know, some sludges some are along. Yeah, organism. some goose along. Yeah, Graham said that last yeah. time. That's what it, kind of started the conversation it, for tonight. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what do we do then? It's like now because now it, it seems so distant, right? We think like, OK, we hope to find it. We're hopeful. But once we actually do discover it now, what do we do? 
And I think that's where we now we make the connections to things that we know of here on Earth. So obviously there's an ethics issue, right? I mean, we already deal with that here, whether it be organizations like PETA or, you know, now we're going towards vegan products because we don't want to limit animal testing and different things like that. Now, if we find life on Earth, whether it be microbial, is there going to be a, a microbial protection organ like organization that's like protecting life on Mars before we destroy it? You know, like now we start going into this snowball effect of like how exactly do we treat this organism and you know another one of my favorite movies was district nine right so now yeah. we have alien life that's out here on earth and now you make all these symbolisms to different things whether it be culturally race dynamics all these apartheid yes now. sir yeah exactly and so that's where my mind goes when i think about these discoveries where do we now make that next step and we have tangible experiences that we've seen here on earth of different ways that we've dealt with animals, whether it be with extinction or endangered species. Now, how do we attribute that to what we discover when we find life on Mars? Do we actually test it? Do we bring it back on here on Earth? And we're so worried about Earth protection and, and protecting the planetary protection. Have we actually thought about Mars protection and protecting that wildlife? You know, we and do. that's where the we, questions we are, yes. are going, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of like the planetary protection thing, but okay, so there's so much to talk about. And oh, just, oh, yeah, oh, 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 Graham, I'm going to go to you in a minute, but oh, we're oh. already an hour down. That's how quick this conversation is going <laughs> because it's just that amazing. And I love this. But, so I just want to say a quick thank you to the panelists so far. This is awesome. This is so great. Um, Graham, I know you want to say something. Then I'm going to try and take a somewhat of a jump once Graham gets done. Yeah, I just want to say so, so we have talked about this a lot. Uh, Charles Cockle and one of his colleagues back in 2004 wrote a paper uh, suggesting the idea of planetary parks. Maybe we should be creating wilderness reserves on Mars and other worlds to protect these worlds for future generations, not just of humans, but for future Carl generations says it. of Carl all Carl says life. maybe we shouldn't uh, even go to Mars. To if life is there, then maybe we should not even friggin' touch it. And I love that. I mean, well, Carl said it a long time ago, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but go. <laughs> Yeah, so so we've been thinking about this for a while, but the problem is, though, I mean, there there are private organizations right now who have their eyes on getting to Mars. There are different national interests right now, and we don't have anything in place right now to prepare us for this. We we have outer space treaty that you know isn't really prepared for dealing with what happens when different organizations start sending spacecraft to Mars. We should be discussing this now, like the the the, the social, the political, the legal consequences of what we're doing in Mars exploration. Uh, we, we definitely need to be having those conversations uh, at the international level right now. Well, I mean, okay, so um, you're mentioning this, and I don't want to go too far because people are talking about Venus, and that's a whole different animal. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going to have to talk about panspermia, the possibilities of that, but let's do this. Let's say, and I love this because we have Professor Mayo here, and I know other people are going to want to talk about this, is that so Mars, Europa, Enceladus, are all worlds that may have something that's similar to ours, but there is no way we go to the moon Titan and find something that's a um, that's a, a methane ba or whatever it could be that could survive in methane. That's that sort of life. You're going to have to find a, a second Genesis of some sort. I cannot imagine that there's a way. And if, if I'm wrong, then the the people that are on here on the ex that are the experts can tell me that. But if we're going to look at this and, and Lou, you, this was a conversation that you had with the man, the man, the myth, the legend. And uh, the thing is, is whenever we look at Titan, it, uh, it, it, it opens our minds with ideas that we could have of life uh, in the universe. So, Lou, let's talk about this. Like you, Titan, decades ago, uh, it's Carl, it's all this stuff, it's something you love. Let's talk about this world that may have something so different than we've ever seen from life. And it might be not in our cosmic backyard. Our cosmic backyard is the next galaxy over. We're talking about like taking a step across the room and finding life. that's nothing like ours. But, well, first of all, Ron, great Carl Sagan impersonation. Uh, Carl says, fantastic. thank you. We all miss Carl. We all miss Carl. God, we miss Carl. Um, so uh, methane. Uh, we know this is important. It can be uh, food. It can be a bi uh, biological byproduct. Uh, Mike Muma at Goddard uh, has uh, spent a fair amount of time uh, with ground-based observations of, of, uh, of Mars uh, trying to detect surface methane because that could be a biomarker for life. And uh, in the troposphere of Titan, 
uh, the, uh, the most uh, abundant volatile is methane. Titan has a nitrogen atmosphere, you know, kind of like Earth, but, uh, but as a minor constituent, methane. Methane should not exist, of course, because it's quite volatile, and so something needs to be replenishing it. So there's a, that's a, that's a um, you know, it's a, that's a seductive question. I mean, where is the methane coming from? How is it still there? But it may not have to be methane because uh, when we fly spacecraft by Titan, when we fly the Voyager spacecraft and we fly the Cassini spacecraft, and we notice how their trajectory changes, we know what the bulk density of Titan is. And there are some uh, intriguing models of the internal makeup of Titan. Um, and it is believed that there is a fair amount of water. On the surface, it's frozen like steel at 94 degrees Kelvin. But uh, under the surface, uh, quite likely uh, oceans of water. It, it is a water world. It is an ocean world uh, by our uh, uh, best estimates. So it may be that there is um, life in water aqueous solutions below the surface that survive. So you have both, both possibilities. Okay, so that's, that's an amazing thing. So we have, we have this place that is unbelievably interesting. Is there anyone here? I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to go fishing on Europa and look out at Jupiter if we can figure out all the problems with that. But is there anywhere in particular, I mean, well, Jason, your work is not, it's not, a, it's not a planet, it's not a moon, you're working on something else. And is this something that you're also looking for and what your work is? And I can't wait for people to hear what you do. Oh, you broke okay. up there for a minute, so I kind of lost you, but I think you're asking about- Yeah, so it's like, uh, it's, not a, it's not a planet, it's oh. not a moon, but you might, are you looking for it as well in the work that you do? And please tell people what it is you're currently working on. So I'm working on a, a Cyrus Rex mission, wearing the shirt today for this. I need one. And it, it's a, a, a robotic spacecraft. Oh, you, I think they sell them. Um, <laughs> it's a robotic spacecraft that's going to, or that is, sorry, at this very, very small asteroid. It's very small, half a kilometer across, uh, such that the force of gravity on the asteroid is just barely higher than the force of gravity felt on the International Space Station. So it's about th uh, five micro Gs. Uh, so almost nothing. Um, and so in 45 days, we're going to touch the surface and grab a sample and bring it back to the Earth in 2023. Uh, this is a, an ancient primitive body that has the same stuff that planets are made out of and has the same kind of chemistry uh, that went into whatever formed uh, life on Earth and perhaps elsewhere. Uh, so no, we don't expect to see any biology. Uh, it's way too dry. Uh, way too old and irradiated to actually get uh, get biology, uh, but it'll tell us something about how about the perhaps ubiquity of biology in the solar system. I also want to jump back and mention uh, there are some issues with Titan. Titan is a super interesting place, but it's also really really cold, and it's hard to have chemistry uh, just based on the on the universal laws of chemistry that operate in a in a situation where you can have uh, reproduction of a biological system faster than uh, any whatever uh, informational system degrades based on natural cosmic ray radiation. It's just so, so slow and so cold. Titan's a really cool, well, literally cold place. It's really, really interesting. Uh, I can't wait for, for Dragonfly, even though I was on the losing mission that was in competition with it mm -hmm. uh, to get a piece of, uh, of a comet and bring that back. But, you know, no hard feelings. Good luck to uh, uh, to Dragonfly. Um, can't wait to see the results. Uh, it's fantastic chemistry, but it's it's hard to understand based on our knowledge of universal chemistry and physics how life could exist uh, in that kind of a cold environment and not lose all of its information to uh, decay. Could I respond to that very quickly? You um, sure can, sir. Go ahead, Good Professor. points, Jason. Excellent points. 95 Kelvin is nothing to play around with. Um, however. Uh, well, okay. Let's just do this real quick because a lot of people are new to this. 
what exactly is Kelvin? There are some things I want to I want to ask for definitions for just to make sure for like there are new people watching this because some of these streams go out to like my own personal Facebook page. So let's give just a quick breakdown of that and like what is Kelvin to Americans? If you were to say it, it Fahrenheit to that, it is nothing to Americans. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> Uh, it's the same kind of incremental scale as centigrade, but it's uh, zero point is minus 270 whatever degrees. Um, and it and so uh, when we talk about very cold temperatures, we can talk about positive numbers when we use the Kelvin scale. The temperature of the surface of Titan in Fahrenheit, which might be more familiar to our listeners, is about minus 290 degrees. And its atmosphere is so thick, 50% uh, uh, greater surface pressure at the surface than the Earth that um, the heat is spread very evenly. So there's not much temperature difference between the poles and the uh, equator. So, uh, but I want to respond to you, Jason, because you make an excellent point. So not on the surface, quite likely not on the surface, but Titan does have a slightly eccentric orbit around Saturn. It's tidally locked. There is some tidal friction. There is uh, uh, some uh, evidence that there could be liquid water oceans underneath. We know that the surface of Titan from the VIMS um, uh, uh, imager on Cassini is very smooth uh, with only a few impact craters. So it is fairly young and it may be being paved over as a possibility. So the question is, how do you get this soup of nitriles and hydrocarbons, this amazing chemical soup that's created from the photolysis of, um, uh, of uh, nit nitrogen and, and methane in the atmosphere. How do you get that below the surface? How would you in order to have uh, uh, some sort of a, a food source for, for things swimming around underneath, underneath the surface of tight? So I agree, not on the surface, but quite possibly under the surface. And even on Earth, now there's speculation that there's greater biomass under the surface of Earth, right? Is this true? Then, then, um, then uh, on, on the surface. I rest my case. Indeed you do. So uh, anybody, um, uh, anyone else want to jump in on that one while we're talking about that area we, of... Okay, we can so, you on all, all night if you want, but... We certainly can. And I mean, I want to make sure that I touch on it if anybody else wants to say... We're looking at something like Titan that is like so close to us that might be the possibility of life. There's so much to go into that I want to jump into as well. Again, we only have an hour left, so there's a lot. But is there anyone else that wants to say this? So we have something like Titan, then we have something like Enceladus or Europa. So um, for those that don't know, Europa. Real, real quick, I'll just, I'll just jump in real quick. Um, just to give a plug for my friend Kevin Hand. Uh, for those watching, if you'd like to really go, go like for a deep dive on on – the icy worlds of our solar system, the ocean worlds of our solar system. Uh, his book, Alien Oceans, is a fantastic read. Um, you can see I, I've bookmarked it all over the place. Uh, he does a good job of talking about the potential for a subsurface ocean on Titan uh, and just considering what's possible in our solar system with Europa and Enceladus and Triton and Pluto and more. Uh, Athena, so a great read. Uh, which one are you looking it. forward to the most? We've got a couple different missions. They're going to go different places. We've seen Jim Green talk about the plumes that are coming out of Enceladus. We all love Europa. Uh, Titans yeah. are really exciting. Is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to mission-wise? Where's the place that you love the most? All right, so you can have one that you love the most. Like Europa is probably the one I love the most. But if I'm really looking at something that's yeah. going to blow my mind, it's going to be Titan, right? So what do you think? Is there something there for you? Anything in particular? Yeah, well, Enceladus gets me really excited. Um, just thinking about uh, when Cassini flew through those plumes uh, in the South Pole. Thank you, Madam Saturn. Southern part of, of Enceladus. Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh Cassini, I missed the Cassini mission. Um, but I think it's really interesting because of like the hydrothermal vents um, that it's very, very probable that, it, that that's what exists um, inside. I believe it's like in the crust of Enceladus, which is this moon and hydrothermal vents exist here on Earth. And that's literally a combination of like boiling hot water mixed with, um, I believe it's a type of it's a type of gas. I don't remember exactly which gas it was, but it, because there's these cracks in the crust of Enceladus, it's seeping through, hence causing those plumes. And the fact that Cassini mission flew through the plumes is really cool. But um, I don't know if there's a mission soon that's going to be going to Enceladus. Um, but I was excited actually about Dragonfly, so I'm glad that that was brought up. 
It's going to be like a drone. <laughs> it's like a t-shirt. You have um, all the t-shirts. But... <laughs> 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 So I'm definitely excited for those. But I hope that there'll be an, a, a mission for Enceladus. Does anyone know if there's one? No, coming up I don't soon? think there's there anything. Was, there was one suggestion called the Enceladus Life Finder. Um, I know my friend Morgan Life Cable was involved Finder. in that. Um, she's out at JPL um, and working on Icy Worlds. Um, but it hasn't been funded. And I, I don't think there's anything currently in the works. Um, but wouldn't it be great to go back and actually – because we, 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 we got to Enceladus with Cassini and discovered the plumes. We, we weren't prepared for those plumes. And, and if we go back now, knowing that they're there with the right instrumentation to look for. It's literally a, a news conference about it. When like Jim that, talks about it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it yeah. It'd be a really cool thing to do if we can get the funding and make it happen. So. Um, Mater, let's go to you, man. Is there anything in particular? Cause I mean, you and I, well, one yeah. thing I want to mention real quick is that both Dr. Lau and uh, Maynard uh, are going to, we're going to be working together on some different shows for stardom. So at stardom space on Instagram, YouTube and all that. Um, and one of the things that I love is we talked about the way that you're going to like kind of tie in, you know, hip hop and music and, and all that entertainment into talking about um, different planets, different worlds, different moons, all the things in, in the solar system. But is there anything in particular about these places that we might find? I mean, it could be Mars. Could it be 4 billion years ago? There was something on Venus. And we're going to talk about panspermia in a minute. Um, could it be the, the water, the water, uh, mm -hmm. worlds, the water moons? Is there anything that really excites you? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to bring up this question and this would be for kind of everybody to answer. And I'm just going to, I always love playing devil's advocate and always kind of looking at things from a different perspective. That's why you're here, man. But, um, you know, we look at all these water planets, right? And we have the, and, yeah, exactly. Right. And we have these ocean worlds, right? Ali exploring alien oceans and Titan and whatnot. Why are we so optimistic that this is our best opportunity to find life? And, that, and I ask that because we look at what we have here. Earth, our very planet Earth that we're on is 70 percent water. Yet, um, I believe the latest study I looked at was about 80 percent of our oceans are currently unmapped. We have such a difficult time discovering and actually exploring our very oceans that are here. And with all the technology that we have with submarine technology and deep sea exploration technology, we still have yet to be able to design things that can be and design even a system to be able to completely map our very ocean. There's so much life that we're discovering on a regular basis uh, in our deep sea and so much that we don't it's know ugly about. And the it's deep mean. Sea, right. <laughs> and and so we think about it, especially if we look at if we uh, if we look at Titan, for example, and we know that the surface is completely covered with ice and our optimism is that underneath there's liquid water. How far underneath? How deep underneath? How deep do we have to go to actually discover the life that's uh, contained within there? Is that even a possibility? If we, if we're even able to get a probe or some other device on there to explore, why do we assume that we'd be able to even find it based on what we know about our deep sea right here on Earth? And that's just a question that I put up there for the rest of the experts on the panel to, to ponder on. Anyone want to hit that one? There's a few, there's a lot of smiles, but there's not anybody like, is there anything in particular that he, he just asked? Did he ask the right question? No. You're, you're muted. Oh, Lou. I, uh, Lou, you, you're muted there. You are now on, well, nope, not yet. Lou's trying. There you go. Go ahead, Lou. Okay, thanks. It's, it's a coupled system, isn't it? As we look at the earth and we find uh, more and more extreme forms of life uh, in extreme environments, we have to expand out, uh, the places that we'll look for life out in the universe. And as we uh, look out in the universe and we find uh, different potentials for habitability and so on, that we can kind of fold that back into where how we would understand our Earth. We have all these laboratories out there that are um, uh, that we can't replicate replicate on Earth, but they're there for our taking and our understanding. So we, we I think we have to do both. Is is my my short answer? Fair enough. Anybody else want to jump in on that before we jump to the next topic? Everyone smiles and says no, Ron. We're good. Okay, so. We've been talking about the solar system, and uh, we're already 15 minutes past the next hour. Let's talk about the ideas of let's get past our solar system. Let's talk about um, two major things. There's the Drake equation of where we're going to find life elsewhere and how it breaks it down. And then there's the follow-up to that that we'll talk about in a minute. So the first thing we need to do is break down the Drake equation. Is there anyone in particular that would like to talk about that 
that's really good at giving a breakdown in a way that people can understand what it is. Athena. Athena has done a really great video on it. Graham, you want to go? Sure. I, I can talk about it for a moment and then let others yep. kind of correct me or jump in as they like. Uh, so first off, the, the, the Drake equation isn't about detection of alien life. It's, it's not about whether or not we're alone in the cosmos. The Drake equation is a the thought numbers. experiment. It, it, it's a thought experiment about probabilities, um, about the potential for there to be extraterrestrial intelligences out there right now who are capable of communicating with us, um, specifically via radio, um, even though there's, there's certain other ways. But the original idea was, was looking in the radio wave you know, region to, to see if we could find ET life. If, if I must stop you for a minute, though, isn't that later in the equation, though? Yeah. That so, we so, get to intelligent life. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm right, so, is all. Flat out, the, 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 the equation is not about whether or not we're alone uh, directly. It's more about whether or not we can actually can, uh, can, can receive signals from ET intelligences. Which, yes, that is a similar thing, but um, the equation itself is not, you know, like we have the exact numbers. Uh, we might one day, but right now we don't. Uh, the equation is built off of this idea of trying to find um, a probable number of civilizations out there right now in the galaxy who can communicate with us. And so it starts by taking a, a number. The, the starting number is the number of stars uh, in our galaxy. And then from that number, it starts breaking down fractions uh, of those stars that most likely have communicating extraterrestrial intelligences. So along the way, we go to the number of planets around those stars. So that's the fraction of those stars that have planets. Then we start looking at the fractions of those planets that could have biospheres on them. Uh, and as we work our way through the equation, we start with this very large number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy, uh, a few hundred billion right now, we think. Um, and we start working our way down to the number of those stars that have civilizations that could, could be communicating right now. Uh, and, and what I think the most important part of the Drake equation is, is the part at the very end about the lifetime of civilizations. Uh, because maybe other civilizations came long before us and they're mostly gone. And they're not communicating right now. And, and maybe we're not in the right time window for another, another, another civilization to communicate right now. Uh, we don't know. Uh, and the interesting thing is that that you know Frank Drake, when he proposed this equation, might not have thought as deeply about that 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 last factor about the the length of civilizations if we hadn't been at a point already where we've tested nuclear weapons and we've already shown ourselves that we can obliterate ourselves overnight. Well, and that's a piece of the uh, the great filter too, yeah. right? Of like you get to a certain point where you're okay, yeah, that's technologically, perhaps, perhaps for life, once we get to a technological point where we start, harnessing the, the power of the atom and we start learning these things, maybe maybe a lot of civilizations tend to kill themselves. Maybe they tend to get to this point. And if if other civilizations like us suffer, you know, these, these petty issues and have to fight over things all the time like we do, maybe they also will, will, will face their own potential destruction. Uh, and as my friend David Grinspoon points out, uh, when he talks about whether or not we are intelligent, maybe the sign of intelligence for an extraterrestrial species uh, isn't whether or not it can say, you know, I think therefore I am, or whether or not it can write down math equations, or whether or not it can create telescopes to look at the heavens. Maybe intelligence comes when a species recognizes uh, its own fragility, its own, its own potential for destroying itself, and specifically acts to fix that on the planet it's on. Um, but the and we think that we we believe that sentience is intelligence. Yeah, but and, is it really truly putting all the pieces together and saying thing. that? Yeah, yeah, and, and so we don't know. But the beauty of the Drake equation is that, like, the, you, there's a lot of numbers that we, we kind of have a good idea about in the early parts of the equation, but towards the end, we really don't know. We don't know how many Earth-like worlds actually have life start on them. Maybe that number is exceedingly small. Maybe it's only one, um, one planet out of all of them. Uh, or maybe it's extremely common for life to originate on worlds in our, in our galaxy. Uh, we don't know. But the idea of the Drake equation is that it's a thought experiment. It allows us to start looking at some of the numbers of potential worlds out there where aliens could be communicating with us right now if only we would listen. Reed, I see you smiling. I think you have something to say. You don't even have to raise your hand. I already saw it. Okay. So um, first, thank you for explaining that very well, Graham. That's a wonderful um, and 
uh, captioning of the Drake equation. Um, another thing about the beauty of the Drake equation is that it, in, in very um, simple terms, it takes your mind and blows it away, right? So there's not a lot of places in the science community where you can find a scientist putting together something that is so simple and yet so mind blowing that by looking at it just once, you totally understand where you start and where you're finished. And you can have a really nice discussion about it and how to go further. So I really like, that's I think the most important impact of the Drake equation, it's in science communication and how uh, people can actually relate to it even if they're not scientists. Like, most of the public knows about the Drake equation and likes to talk about it, even if they're not scientists or into astronomy or anything like that. It's just a mind blowing idea. And uh, I think the Kepler mission had a lot to do with filling out those numbers in the beginning of the equation. For instance, how many habitable worlds are out there uh, in our galaxy. And so it's also sort of like a compass for some of us who are working in the astrophysics and the astronomy and the cosmology uh, area in order to get us more closer to the answer to the to that arrow that the Drake equation is is looking at and the most interesting and another interesting impact about it is that it doesn't take into account time scales you know like we are in the civilization we're just now sort of like in a global aspect of our planet and perhaps the civilization human civilization like and a quick modern. note too there are different ideas of uh, as we talk about civilizations. There's we were at type zero. We're coming up on type one. There are type two, type three, type four. As you dive deeper into this, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, and that's kind of something that Rio's talking about now. Yeah, and and so aside from the the types of communication, yeah, you look at the generation. Like, what is the generation time? Right, we look at an E. coli, and it has a twenty minute generation time, and it doubles. And each of us has maybe 80 years. What does it mean when you have to look at a planet that is like, you know, 1,000, 50,000 million, you know, light years away that has absolutely no connection to you, that has no connection to us as humans? We don't have the generation time in order to have that type of overview for a long, long, long time in the scale that the universe is built in. And that's something that is not in the Drake equation. So uh, I think it should be added like as another layer or dimension or something. Uh, Lou, I see you go with a smile on your face. Now, actually, Jason, let's go to you first to see you're getting ready. To oh, sure. A couple of things. So, yeah, the Drake equation is a great way of helping us figure out what questions to ask. And, of course, it is based on looking at uh, intelligent life, which, of course, as Drake defined it, is life that has a radio telescope to communicate. Uh, that was the definition. Uh, there's an... There's something else that, that Frank Drake uh, started saying um, more recently, uh, well, 20 years ago or something, so more recently, um, is that there's another kind of ways, uh, way that, that, that uh, civilizations die, according to the, to the Drake equation. That is, they become more efficient. They don't necessarily have to kill themselves, but they can um, become so efficient in their communication that uh, there's less uh, information leaking out. Uh, so as you have uh, directed communication, very narrow beams, uh, laser comm, or, or what have you, then there's less ability to eavesdrop. And so as technology improves, they actually get quieter, not louder, which is something that Frank hadn't thought about uh, in the 1970s when he was thinking about this equation. And uh, Professor Mayo, I think you, were, you, you had a smile on your face, so throw something out to us. I was just thinking about the comment about um, having a civilization so far away that uh, if you send a spacecraft with people in it, the people you send are not going to um, not going to get there. It will be generation after generation uh, to get there. Um, and it, it kind of seems to me that this is this is the the root of all this is is in existentialism. This is the this is the ultimate existential question: Are, are we alone? Are we alone? Right. And uh, I'm not so. Uh, what a wonderful! Uh, it's, it's almost uh, you know. The, um, uh, we are the universe's way of knowing itself. Yes. 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 Um, and so uh, it, it's a, a gift to our species to get on such a rocket ship and travel for hundreds, thousands of or more years. But I'm not sure that's how we're going to get there. 
um, it seems to me that a much better way to get there is to take very tiny robots um, and accelerate them to very high speeds, let them go on the journey, and then have some form of telepresence uh, by the time that they get wherever it is they're going. Uh, we, we, we can extrapolate a little bit in the future, right? We, when we think of traveling places in space, we have spaceships. These are large, fancy tin cans that we put ourselves in, and they go places. But maybe that's not, in fact, how we're going to get to, if we ever do, uh, other, other, other worlds outside the, outside the solar system. Uh, maybe something quite different. See you jumping up and down, Athena. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hit us. I know this is something that you love and talk about. Yeah, this has got me thinking a lot. And I want to ask everyone a question that I, I've gotten from, I've done quite a few videos online about the Drake equation. And I get a few really interesting questions um, that I'm going to touch on in a second of, as to why I said in the beginning of today's stream, I was like discrepancies in Drake, in the Drake equation. The reason I use the term discrepancies is because there's a huge question around it. Um, but before I get to that question, I wanted to ask you guys something. So while um, the, uh, Mayo was speaking, Lou Mayo, um, I thought when he was saying, are we alone? What I'm wondering, this is going to be a very big question for everyone, is would it matter if we find out that we're not alone, but the form yes. of life that we find doesn't communicate the way we do or isn't intelligent like we are? I feel like it would still matter. but it almost feels like we have this undying need to find life beyond earth that is intelligent enough to our standards. And to me, it makes me think then it's a really big open ended question is if we do find something that is less intelligent than us, say like extremophiles, for instance, if we find a microbial life, or even if we find a form of life that hasn't built the radio telescope to communicate with us, what are we going to do with that? And are we going to essentially enslave it like we tend to do with a lot of the living life that we find here on Earth? Super intense question, but that's one of them. And I've gotten it a lot in my live streams when we speak about this type of stuff. The other thing I'll ask a little bit later, but it's about um, the forms of communication and the forms of life that might exist. And how do we know whether or not it actually can communicate the yep. way that the Drake equation says it should? Or, um, or or can we communicate the way that they think we should? They because we should. they're a, we're a, they're a thousand years ahead of us. They're ten thousand a million years ahead right. of us. So yeah, yeah. A, a radio telescope can seem antique. So those are really big questions. But I'm just super curious to know what you guys have to say about that because I get that a lot online so, and I leave it as open ended. I love this because I can see all the smiles. I can see everything that's going on and everybody's smiling right now. So read it. I'm going to go to you first and Graham's going to fix his hair. Then we'll go to him. We're just going to go through. Okay. And I also want to leave Maynard out of this because Maynard's like gooey okay. faced about this right now too. So read it. We'll go to you first. <laughs> okay. So um, very quickly, just uh, answering a small portion of your delightful uh, array of questions is that um, we are very good at not just enslaving, but you know, better our, our species and better our lives. So for instance, when you talk about microorganism and how we enslave them, nobody thinks about that in those type of terms at all. And basically what happens is that we are built from microorganisms, okay? They're very important to our microbiota and to our gut. Yeah, and uh, super important for that. We get medicine, we get antibiotics from, from you know mushrooms and uh, bacteria and so on and so forth. We take pigments and we put them into serums, into creams, and we got UV screening out of it. And, and we use, of course, yeast when we do things that are connected with beer and that are connected with bread and all those yummy things we like to eat. And so um, microorganism, finding other microorganisms is something that we can deal with fantastically and has actually, in my opinion, no moral, okay, I'll be very cautious here. So as a scientist, I do not want to just go ahead and use something. I'm interested in researching and understanding it better before I actually put it into any kind, any kind of biotechnological application. And actually we're using a very, very tiny portion of the current microorganism diversity that we have on this planet in order to get all these magnificent solutions and lifestyle and, you know, uh, astaxanthin for our, you know, for as a redox 
um, for a for a better eye, you know, uh, better eye treatment or whatever in the retinal. So, anyways, so we're really good at understanding and researching microorganisms, but that's of course coming from a very anthropocentric point of view, from for, from a human point of view and from our science that went on for centuries here on planet Earth. So for me to find microorganism is, is, a, is a great plus. We can research it. There's not a lot of moral issues and in-depth, you know, ethical issues that go into it. Yes, we want to protect it. It's a completely new life form and a completely different planet or anywhere else. And I will definitely put decades of research before I do anything uh, remotely connected to biotechnological application. But we gained so much so much for microorganisms here. So one of my um, topics is that I tell people we have to go and search for extremophiles because then we can generally get really good solution and antibiotics and new medicine. And we have a lot of issues now in the medical profession about you know the big uh, anti um, uh, antibiotics resistance and we can get all these new metabolites from nature. So we should go and we should, should research and we put effort into that. Um, so that's just for that small portion about enslaving new life forms. I mean, anything that is above microorganism, uh, micro level, I would be very, very, very cautious with it. But uh, anything below that, and you know, there's the issue of a second genesis and so on and so forth. So it's an interesting, yes. it's a very interesting topic. But it's it's not from a species, human species, you know, narcissistic point of view. It's like it's a no brainer in my point of view. But that's um, all right, uh, Graham, I'm going to go to you in a minute, but I had to throw in Maynard because we kind of miss him there for a little bit. And he's smiling and writing as fast as he can. And I know <laughs> I can see that smile on his face. So, I mean, I'm not, I, like, I just want to hear your thoughts. It doesn't need to be I'm a super expert, but I know you're mm -hmm. loving this right now, man. So tell mm -hmm. me what just what you're thinking right now and how much you're loving this. No, I'm I'm just I'm just geeking out right now, and I and I and I've, I've been having this weird geeking smile on my face since since Graham first spoke, because he said something that was really profound and that I that I wrote down, and I was just thinking, and I was like, is intelligent life defined by our ability to no longer exist, right? Because you brought up the whole concept of you know nuclear technology that we have, right? And now we have the ability to completely eradicate our entire planet in, with just the press of a button, right? And now if we if we now uh, if we now interpret that to other intelligent life is the, is the reason that we can't find ex uh, intelligent life because they've already gained that intelligence to the point where they've completely eradicated their entire civilization. And that's why we can, and maybe we are the unintelligent life because we're not at that point yet where we've completely eradicated ourselves. I, to me, I, I thought that was really just profound, right? The ability to be able to completely destroy ourselves once we've gained that intelligence now completely wipes us out and makes us no longer being able to be found. I thought that was pretty crazy. So I was, I was geeking out on that. And then, um, and then to go back to Athena's point um, about intelligent life, and I guess the question guy, will we be disappointed now if we don't find intelligent life and it's only microbial life? Um, and I think it almost comes down to an issue of will we respect it, right? Because if we nope. think about- Because we're, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're humans. Hey, yes, because exactly. we're humans. Because I mean, we, we as life as we know it here on earth started as microbial life, right? So if we didn't let uh, hundreds of millions of years pass where that microbial life can now evolve and turn into who we are as humans, right? We wouldn't have us, right? It's, but at the same time, we look at microbial life here as just things to test, right? So whether it comes down to yeast to, you know, to, to, to cook with or uh, microbial organisms that live within us to kind of learn how cancers develop or how our bodies, you know, uh, heal itself or different things like that to, for our own benefit. Now we find microbial life on, on other planets our first thought, first thought philosophy or what our third, uh, thought process is going to be, we're going to treat it like we do in microbes on Earth. We're going to study it. We're going to run tests on it. We're going to figure out how it could improve us as humans. We're going to figure out how it could improve our health. It could be the cure for cancer. Could it be a cure for you, leukemia? Could it help, you yes, know, it help neurotic you know, functions and different things like that? That's what our first thought is going to be. And so do we even respect what we find? Because it's going to be different if we actually go on Mars and we see an organism that looks and moves like us. Now there's the whole ethics issue and a whole thing because now it, it simulates us. But if it doesn't simulate us, do we, should, we have, should we lose that same respect and just go immediately to testing and finding ways for it to benefit our own life? And that's kind of what I think about when I hear these different topics on. All right. So just a real quick question, because I know there's a lot of smiles going <laughs> on right now. I got to go to like everybody else. We have like 27 minutes left. Is everybody okay to go over for this? 
because no one else has a show after this. So we might go a little bit over if everyone's okay with it. You let me know if you got to leave, but Graham, I'm going to go you first. Yeah. 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 I'll tap out a little Work. early because it's almost no worries, no worries. Time, Graham, I want to go to you, and then I want to see um, uh, Graham, uh, and then Jason, and then and then Lou. Uh, yeah. So, so first off, uh, love all the conversation, everyone. It's been great. Um, uh, I know Ron loves when I point this out. Wait, wait, you, wait. You wait, have wait. To always say <laughs> go to that later. I don't want to go too far into that because that's going to be a big conversation. Okay. So, touch on that for a second, then we'll go back to it. <laughs> Well, that, that comes off of what, what Athena was saying, though, is, is whether or not we're alone. Like, Grandma said, talk know, about it later. If you go out I'm there just and we find life, it, it, it's going to be altering no matter what we do if we find life out there. Um, if it's microbial or if it's you know super intelligent life or if it's super, super intelligent life and wants to destroy us, um, there's a lot of things that could happen. But if we, if we go to Mars or Europa or even Titan and find some weird life there um, – it's going to give us comparative biology. It's going to tell us a few things if we find it in our solar system. One, so we were discussing earlier in the chats on Facebook and, and, and Twitch and a few other places. I saw everyone like talking about DNA and whether or not we find DNA on Mars. Um, it's unlikely that we'll find DNA on Mars, but not impossible. Maybe convergent evolution finds DNA. Maybe DNA is, is a common molecule, but it uses different bases and, and different coding uh, to code life. Or maybe panspermia happened and... and we find a cell on Mars and it has DNA and we can show it's Martian, but we can also show that that DNA is very similar to early life as we know it here on, here on Earth, then maybe panspermia happened. M maybe life came here from Mars or maybe life went to Mars early on. Um, we just, you know, we don't know, but comparative biology would be huge for us because right now we have that N equals one problem as we call it. We have, we have life on Earth. We have our beautiful biosphere with all of its diversity it's very long history, it's storied connection to the planet. But if we find life somewhere else on another world with its environment elsewhere, that gives us a chance to really figure out who and what we are. And that's huge. Um, and then I guess we can talk more later then about the potential for getting destroyed by more intelligent aliens as well. We will be <laughs> destroyed. Okay, so uh, <laughs> Jason, we're going to you next and then we'll go to you, Lou. Sure. So uh, we can first look to what happened uh, with the Allen Hills uh, Martian Meteorite ALH 84001 in uh, 1996, when there was uh, evidence that actually there, uh, there was a presidential press conference over the detection of uh, punitive de uh, detection of, uh, of uh, Martian life. And so that can give us a clue about how society might react, might react to extant life, which was with interest, but not as much interest as I would have hoped. Um, Graham has a very good point that uh, if we do detect uh, alien life, and it will be uh, certainly uh, microscopic, if not microbial, um, we'll learn a lot about our own biology and probably uh, we'll learn much, much more for uh, uh, medicine, etc. by looking at how life is the same, how life is different, how it works. Uh, the risk of exploiting uh, an alien biota is minimized by the cost of doing that. Uh, we live in a world that's governed by economics and money. And so if there isn't an economic motive to go there and uh, exploit uh, uh, Martian life, well, we're not going to do it. It's going to be a scientific curiosity, which is, of course, fine with me. Uh, so I, I wouldn't worry at this point about, certainly not about um, macroscopic critters running around on Mars or um, uh, Enceladus Europa, uh, Ceres, another great place in the great ocean world. Um, but looking at microbial organisms uh, is going to be very hard to come up with an economic reason to go there for the purpose of exploiting that biology. So uh, they're probably safe, at least for the, for the short run. Thank you, Doctor. Over to you, Lou. Lou, my oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Um this has been a long time for you. I mean, you, you've you not not trying to say this like I'm not an ageist, but I mean, this is something that's been your baby for a long time before people really, truly took it seriously. And you love this. I, I've, I've seen your smile for almost two hours now, and I can tell <laughs> that you're really enjoying this. And I would love that you're I here. Am. And I I, I'm really loving the fact that you're part of this. So hit us with this, man. And where, love, where are you at on it? I love being part of this this community of people who are interested in these space fam. questions. Um, 
the way that you count life is uh, one, two, many. So we have one here on Earth. <laughs> That's awesome. And if we find two, if we find life, even microbial life, anywhere else, then the possibilities for finding life in abundance in all through the universe jumps dramatically, okay? So even if it's microbial life, I think um, it, it's kind of the never ending search, isn't it? Uh, we will never, I imagine, uh, find all the life there is or explore all the worlds to, to, to find out if there's life. But uh, if we find life in one other place, then all of a sudden we're thinking that we live in a universe that could be teeming with life. So the question of how we would, um, how we would address this, how we'd receive this information on earth, I think is an interesting one. Sadly, an awful lot of our species is still quite superstitious. I remember uh, uh, my group at Goddard uh, was um, highlighting the 2017 eclipse for NASA. And uh, I looked into some of the cultural issues around eclipses. Some people are afraid to go outside that the rays of the sun will hurt them. Uh, then there was certain a certain orange thing that just looked straight up at the sky and said, oh, it's fine. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, or would hurt their unborn child, or or um, all kinds of all kinds of superstition. Uh, yeah, Archaeo astronomy, right? Yes, sir. So um, I think there will be people who will uh, reject it. Doesn't fit with their way of looking at the world. There will be people who uh, go the other direction and expand it far beyond what what it uh, would have to mean. As, in other words, a, a real threat to themselves. Um, and then there will be people, most people will filter it through their, uh, their, their understanding of the world, which I think in a lot of cases is not very scientifically based. So that's my thought. Okay, so we've talked about the Drake equation. Let's talk about the one that says, why not? Why haven't we found anything yet? Which is, who wants to say it first? On the count of three, one, two, three. Fermi Paradox. I'm not Boom! The only one Athena, you it. go first. Fermi Paradox. I know you've done a video for it. Do you want do you want to be the person that does it? Go ahead and uh sure. hit us with it. Jason's just like, I'm out. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> He's gone. So totally gone. there's there's this, and then there's the Fermi Paradox. The Fermi Why paradox. haven't we? Why yep. haven't we come in contact with any alien life? Welcome back, oh. Dr. Dworkin. <laughs> yeah. Yay! Um, so Enrico for me, Italian. Graham made me thirsty. <laughs> he made me thirsty, man. We're all. And that's the fun. The fun thing about this: the more we drink, the longer we we blabber and love this. So, so yeah, true. go ahead. I just I just got more liquid stardust, so uh, I'm all I'm all set. Um, it's just water. H two O. You are the universe drinking itself. I am. Um, so Fermi paradox. Um, so Enrico Fermi, Italian physicist. Um, essentially was the first person to ask the question of, you know, if there are all of these possible planets that can exist within just the Milky Way alone, but in the universe where life can possibly exist, where are the aliens? And so looking at, um, we mentioned earlier, like different types of civilizations and um, the possible filters. So it's already kind of been touched on is, okay, um, what are the different types of civilizations, which mean like type one is being able to harness all of the energy from the star that you're orbiting, sorry, from the planet. Type two, harnessing all the energy from the star you're orbiting. So for us, the sun. And then type three, being able to harness all of the energy of the galaxy. Oh my God, Yeah, That's like awesome. Totally traveling throughout the galaxy. And then the filter is like, say, nuclear warfare, what maybe killed off the civilization before they could even reach uh, contact with anybody else. And, um, or maybe they, their, their civilization completely died, um, climate change, global warming, all these different things, which we're going to talk about, but that essentially, um, they're coming they, for they, you, man. They're coming for you. Yep. You're muted. Go ahead. I was just messing with him. Oh, I was like, are we switching? I was like, no, 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 no. He, anyway. he was, he was, he was, uh, he was writing stuff down. I just would have threw him off. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm but totally done. Uh, we, we let's let's do the switch. Oh, switch. switch. That's what I do. That's what I do. Go ahead. I'll pass it to someone else. 
Oh, you're fine. Go ahead. I was just messing with. Wait. I was just messing with Maynard. He was all <laughs> smiling, like just writing down. I mean, just just going into it. So I just okay. had to mess with for a second. Yeah, that that is where I was gonna wrap. Uh, like, I mean, I don't mean like rap. I'm like sing. I mean, like I was gonna wrap up my sentence. So I'm actually done. Fair enough. <laughs> so, okay, so that's the general breakdown of what this is. Is there know. anyone here that wants to add to that of what the Fermi paradox is? Because again, there's tons of smiles here. Anyone want to go first? Raise your hand. No one wants to say anything else. Okay, so sure. Yes. I, I, I'll jump. I'll jump in for a minute. Um, first off, so I'm one of those people who I, I don't like calling this a paradox because we have so many possible solutions. A, a paradox is a problem that you can't solve, right? And we actually have lots of potential solutions, lots of reasons that that we might not see them yet. When Enrico Fermi was at that lunch and they were discussing um, the potential for, for traveling closer at the speed of light and traveling through uh, our, our Milky Way and getting to other worlds, when he said, you know, where are they? Um, and he posed that question of, of where are they? Um, he, didn't, he didn't mean it as a paradox. It, it was never intended to be a paradox. And, and since that time, a lot of astrobiologists, a lot of thinkers, philosophers of, of science have thrown their heads at this thing. And there's a lot of possible answers. Um, for instance, I, I love the idea of the cosmic zoo. Uh, may, maybe it's like, yes, <laughs> South Park. Yeah, m maybe we're being hidden. Yeah, like in South Park, the aliens come down. B baby farts, McGeezak, space well, farts. Welcome to what, what, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> there's going to be deer. There's going to be all that's, kinds of things in this season. We can't wait to see what happens next. That's it. Everyone watching, me and Ron, we're going to build a Pineward Derby car, and we're going to send it to space and bring the aliens yeah, here tomorrow. Guys. I don't we're really gonna, know what we're going to do, but we're going to work it we're out. We're going to do this. We're going to bring them here, and then we're not going to lie about it. That, that's, the, that's the big thing. Don't lie to the smart aliens. Um, but but there's, a of, my <laughs> there's a lot of possible answers, though. Um, one, so so maybe we are amongst the earliest. M maybe it took a long time for there to be enough contamination. Uh, as astronomers like to call it metallicity, anything heavier than hydrogen and helium. Um, mm -hmm. The rest of us would say other elements um, out there uh, to build up for worlds to, to start developing life. M maybe, maybe life has only been around for, for a few billion years. Maybe the time it takes for life to, to come to intelligence on a planet uh, is actually longer than 4 billion years most of the time. Maybe Earth is special. Maybe we came around first. Uh, that's another possible answer. Um, and again, we also, from the, from the Drake equation, we have this idea that maybe, maybe eventually most civilizations destroy themselves. Maybe the, the barrier to becoming an intelligent uh, being, an intelligent race in the universe is to get smart. And realize that you don't have to kill each other. You don't have to fight over it. And may maybe for us, maybe taking those first steps into the cosmos and looking back at our world from space, having that overview effect, seeing the blue marble, maybe this is our moment right now. Maybe these decades, the next century, it's time for us to grow up ours, to fix this stuff. Our Zephram Cochran. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe it's time. Maybe maybe it'll be Ron and Graham Cochran launching their Pinewood Derby car that brings the Vulcans here. And then we have it. We have it Absolutely nice fit shape. <laughs> just like, let's go to space, <laughs> yeah. man. Let's do the thing. Let's do it. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, and I would definitely listen to Steppenwolf, by the way, if I'm launching off uh, uh, on a faster than light uh, spacecraft. Uh, <laughs> I'm totally doing that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, but there's a lot of possible reasons that we haven't seen alien life yet. The Fermi paradox has a lot of possible solutions. Uh, but also, maybe we are alone. And I'll throw it out there again. Maybe we're, Maybe we're alone. Let's flashback. Okay, so we're talking about this and all these different ideas, but let's go to the fact that we may be part of something that is this um, galaxy or universe where life bounces around called panspermia. And I think it's the, uh, the best way for us to wrap up is that at some point before we had life here, it was very tumultuous in the in the early years for Earth because we had Thea or Thea. I'm not exactly sure the name of it, what we're calling it where another planet only smashed into us. And that is very different from what Venus was like and what Mars was like in their earlier lives. So there's the idea that possibly life came from another planet or somewhere else. So is there anyone want to talk about that? About That's a very real thing because somebody mentioned Pr Prometheus earlier. So there's, it could have just happened or we were so far, if you've ever watched Cosmos, you will see that they break everything down to the cosmic year. And in the cosmic year 
it was August of that year before our solar system even began. So there was so much po- there's so much possibility of life for those eight months of the cosmic year that maybe something seeded our planet. That's when you get into the ridiculousness of pseudoscience and could there have been something that did that? Yes, there could have. And we get to like the crazy hair stuff. But no, there's also the other side of maybe it was another planet had some microbial life. It got here and then it blossomed. So panspermia. Anyone want to talk about that real quick as we start to kind of wrap up? Rio? You muted yourself. You were actually unmuted. You did. Yeah. So, uh, panspermia. Yeah. So, uh, panspermia is something that has been around for decades now. It doesn't have really good, like, when I talk about the beginning of life on planet Earth, and I talk about how people theorize what happened, like, with the first molecule, whether it's DNA, protein, membrane, um, and how the, the first still arrive. I, I do introduce panspermia as one of those theories, but I do say that it's only like half the, the answer. I say, look, it's panspermia has been here around and they, basically it's a, theory, it's a theory that says that life did not start on planet Earth, but the basic uh, organic compounds and perhaps the first cell actually came here to planet Earth in uh, early times um, on a meteorite or on a meteor and things like that. And it doesn't really solve the real mechanistic, interesting issue of how did life, like how a bi- biological entity actually came to a being and, and evolved on planet Earth. So it's an interesting theory. There has been a few um, um, research done to, to show that, you know, certain forms can withstand interstellar, uh, interstellar um, voyages and impacts like the Rosetta mission and so on and so forth. And when you can you put things in space and you see that they can survive it for a certain time and amount and perhaps everything, but we've never really shown it to be a true, uh, a very robust uh, mechanism for a lot of microorganisms that we know today are on planet earth. And there are certainly a lot of basic tools like DNA and RNA, which are not entirely stable under really harsh conditions of interstellar um, interstellar condition. We know amino acids are prevalent uh, on, meteorite, on meteorites and things like that, but having just the amino acid is a very far, far step, in my opinion, than from having a, a, a cell that is functional and does metabolic uh, functions and so on and so forth. So panspermia is, is nice. And like Graham said before, if we do, for some reason, find uh, a life form on Mars or in Venus or someplace else, which actually does share our own uh, building blocks and we can detect it, then that's actually a really good affirmation of the panspermia, um, the panspermia theory. But at the moment, I don't find it to be so much like a really, you know, good idea, solid from an evidential point of view. But, you know, we keep researching it. We hope to see what more evidence we can get. That's sure. It. Anyone else is like is really really excited about this idea. Is like is that the answer? Or that's not absolute. There's no way that's the answer. Anyone want to jump in? I, mean, I like hypotheses. <laughs> I right, had a all right, let's let's I go to Maynard thought. first, and then we'll go to Jason and uh, Lou. Sorry. Sorry. No, I just had a, I just had a question on this topic on panspermia. Now, is the concept now that life came from uh from you know from it could be an asteroid, some other body, or was it that it, it was coupled by, um, by, you know, by elements and characteristics of Earth. Is it the combination of the two or specifically that the life was just on this other existing object that made impact with Earth? Because in my head, that's kind of what I think about, right? It, is, are we unique here on Earth because we had the unique building blocks that, that, were, that were just perfect for, an, or for another object that uh, made impact with Earth for those now to combine to be able to develop life. So, you know um, Jason, you want to go first? Yeah, I was saying I, I like hypotheses that I can test. So we need to frame these questions in a, in a testable manner. Yes, sir. Uh, but, By the way, but as, let's just say yeah. this real quick, if I can. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's, this is why science matters. We all love the ideas of this thing's super cool, but that's why it matters to have people that are doctors on the show that are that are science communicators like that are on this show that are saying that's a cool idea, but and that's what Jason is going to go into. So, and, right, and there are two kind of of panspermias. 
uh, that Manon was going on to. Uh, one is is uh, quite reasonable, which is that the uh, chemical components of life are found widely in the solar system, if not the universe. Uh, the things like amino acids and nucleobases and sugars and the components, the reduced carbon that can go into life if it found the right environment. And maybe Earth was the right environment with its plate tectonics and moon to stabilize the orbit and magnetic field, all those things. The other kind is that there are uh, microbes living or, or uh, existing inside of objects, like say a womb moa, that moves from solar system to solar system, depositing their spores and making life uh, all over the, the, the universe. There is no evidence for any of that. Um, if you found your lose uh, one, two, many life, then you could start testing that hypothesis. But right now, with an n of one, we can't even approach to consider uh, the distinction between uh, life coming from different sources or ingredients life ingredients for life coming from different sources uh, because we have no idea yet. Yes, thank you, man. All right, so anyone else? I mean, who else wants to jump in there for that one? Uh, Lou, yeah, I see you with a uh, smile on your face and a pin in your hand. You're about to go professor on us. Hit us. Well, uh, Jason has uh, an excellent point. We don't have any evidence. So what we're left with is um, possibilities, uh, kind of like our exploration of Mars. Is it habitable? Was it habitable? Could it have supported life? Um, and uh, so that's fine. We can still do that. We just have to realize what we're what we're talking about. So, in the case of Mars, um, we know that it uh, used to be quite hospitable, or, or much more hospitable than it is today. Uh, liquid water oceans, uh, in all likelihood, uh, were present mostly in the northern hemisphere. Uh, much warmer temperatures, much higher atmospheric pressures. We know uh, Mars lost its uh, uh, dynamo. We know this from the MAVEN spacecraft, uh, the, uh, the, that the uh, solar wind is eroding the atmosphere. And Mars is a much more uh, 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 kind of barren place than, than it used to be, we think. It also doesn't weigh much. So we see um, uh, impact craters on Mars. And uh, it would take uh, less energy to to accelerate something off the surface of Mars than it would, say, Earth or, or other, other larger objects. So it, it's quite possible that we, and we know, we know, it's not just possible, we know we have Mars meteorites. We know they're from Mars because we can look inside them and we can go, we can go find little bubbles of trapped air and we can measure the isotopic ratios in those tiny bubbles in those, in those meteorites and we can tell that uh, they match uh, the atmosphere of Mars. So they came from Mars. So we know that's possible. And we also know uh, or believe uh, from, from lots of pieces of scientific evidence that Mars used to be much wetter, much warmer, much more hospitable. So I think um, it's quite likely that uh, the Earth has been pelted by, uh, I mean, look at the Hellas Basin. Uh, the, Earth, the Earth has been pelted by uh, collisions that Mars has had with this dirty solar system that we've we've had for four and a half billion years. Whether there was life in it or not, I, is you can't say. We don't know, but it's it seems possible. Go ahead and uh, wrap up with uh, final thoughts right now, uh, Grandma. I want to go to you first because I mean one of your big things is that. And we didn't really get to it because, I mean, again, we're at two hours. We have already ran for two hours. <laughs> and that's why I love this. That's why a lot of people that are on here and how amazing this is. But, Graham, one of your big things is that we have to really sit down and say that maybe we're there. I mean, we're looking at uh, the possibility of a universe that will be here for trillions of years. Maybe we have truly made it to the point and we might be the first ones. Maybe there was so much before us. But we have to sit back and say – but as scientists, as people that are really, truly taking the time to be analytic about what's going on, that we might not, that we might be alone, that we are the first that has truly made it to not only sentience, but the the ability as sentient beings to say, 
there might be something else out there. So I'll go to you first for mm-hmm. final thoughts. And also, at the end, yeah. tell everybody where they can uh, find you. So, yeah. Uh, so so I'm, I'm sure many everyone watching, everyone on the panel has seen Contact, if not read the novel Contact by Carl Sagan. Uh, and remembers that, remembers that quote very well, that uh, that if we are alone in all of this, it seems like just a huge waste of space. There's just there's just so much out there. There's so much potential. So many stars. And we now know, I mean, in, in my lifetime, we've now discovered over 4,000 exoplanets. We now know from that alone that there should be just many, many trillions and trillions of worlds out there. The possibilities seem almost endless, but we, we, we don't know. We could be alone. And one of my favorite uh, quotes, it's, it's attributed to Arthur C. Clarke, even though it actually comes from Stanley Kubrick. And so we don't actually know if, if, if Arthur C. Clarke said it exactly this way or not. But the quote goes that sometimes I think we're alone in the universe and sometimes I think we're not. And either, either way, the idea is quite staggering. And I agree entirely. If, if we're alone in all of this vast cosmos, then I, I feel almost like we have a duty almost to be better, uh, to protect life. Because if we destroy it, then we've taken away the, the only blessing of life this universe has ever known. That, that would be so sad. And, and we owe it to ourselves for that reason to explore more about what life is and, and what we are and why we're here. But even though I, I think as a scientist, and I think logically we have to admit we could be alone, it feels like we can't be. And as a human, as, as someone who dreams and wonders and wants to know more, I, f- I feel like we can't be alone. There must be more out there. And so this journey of astrobiology, of us learning more about our place in the cosmos and going <laughs> to explore together, I think is, is the greatest thing we humans can do for ourselves. Uh, we, we need to solve our problems here, not, not just our socio-political problems or problems with ourselves, uh, our problems with how we treat our planet. But in that process, we'll learn so much more about life, so much more about how planets function. And by going out right now and taking those first little baby steps that we've taken, and it's really just baby steps, we've barely left our planet. The furthest humans have been is just slightly past the moon on Apollo 13. And so we have so much more to do yet to learn more about our place in the cosmos. And so I think we need to keep exploring because maybe we're not alone. And maybe there's something out there that will give us so much more knowledge about ourselves once you discover it. Ryut, I want to go to you next for uh, final thoughts and where you're at on this and how amazing it is. As the sun comes up behind you, and we love you for doing this and like being on here, and I hope it was worthwhile for you to, to get up this early, um, being uh, who and what you are. So we appreciate you. So um, your final thoughts. Um, my final thoughts, they're never final. <laughs> Perfect. Not your final thoughts, just for the people that have been watching the stream about like how much this means to you. This is your life's work, just like so many people on here. Yeah. So this has been an absolutely delightful like, conversation, and I'm very happy to meet all the people I've just met. It's amazing. Thank you very much for all your uh, intelligent comments and, uh, and and insight. I just loved everything. Um, my final thought is that we need to keep on the discussion. My final thought is that I don't think that we are alone. Um, My final thought is that now there's so much more focus on astrobiology. We really should hit it also with missions which are nailing those questions which are very interesting, not only to us, the scientists, but obviously for the public who is the taxpayer for most of these research research missions. And I'm looking forward for a new decade of, of, you know, discoveries and amazing things. Yeah. So thank you. And this is my daughter. (laughs) <laughs> oh, how are you? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go to uh, I'm going to go to Lou. Lou next. Yeah, yeah. Uh, final thoughts as we wrap up and uh, all the all the beautiful things you've seen. I mean, you've been around, and this has been something that you love, and it was something that I'm willing to guess that it wasn't taken as seriously as it is now. And I know you have to love that there's so many people in conversation about this from your time with Carl and everything that you've done, and like to the people that I'm absolutely sure that you've inspired. And one, I'm going to thank you for coming on tonight and for Eddie Gonzalez to, uh, for introducing me and you, because it's been a fun conversation, but I, I can't wait to hear what you want to say, man. It, it has been fun. I, 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 I love being with my peeps. So it's very nice to meet all of you. I'm, I'm not sure that I, I, I'm speaking as a scientist anymore. 
when I think of final thoughts, um, more just as a, a, a human being. So I'm, I'm taking my scientist hat off for a moment. Um, we are explorers. Our species explores. And we explore perhaps for these existential reasons that I mentioned, but I think also to extend our will and our consciousness um, uh, beyond our, our limits, our current limits. Anyone who's ever tried to see how far they could throw a stone across a river, maybe see how many hops you can get with a flat, with a flat stone, you're extending your, yourself beyond your limitations. And so uh, it may be that uh, part of our mission as being human beings is to uh, extend our selves through the earth and and then through the through the universe, extend our consciousness. Um, we know, as I think I mentioned, and we all know that uh, our the physics on earth is the same physics in the cosmos. Uh, the ways that uh, atoms come together happens on earth and it happens in the same way on other planets and uh, throughout the universe. So I think there's every reason to believe that as we exercise our primary objective, perhaps I'm suggesting of uh, going out and exploring that we will find life, we'll find other beings that are either similar or not similar to us, but we will have an answer uh, to the question. And I believe the answer will be that we are not ultimately alone. Beautiful. Maynard, go to you next. I was, I was, just, uh, I was just about to play some Michael Jackson. You are not alone. alone. I am here with, with you. you. <laughs> just say it. What happened was. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think um, my final thoughts kind of uh, jive with what uh, everybody's spoken so far, especially what Graham would, uh, said. Um, you really think about it from a philosoph uh, philosophical standpoint, right, of discovery and understanding. And I think both spectrums kind of showcase uh, our responsibility as humans, right? If we do find life, then we now have this understanding of how insignificant that we are, uh, because now we know of, of, you know, intelligent life that's elsewhere. We find life that's more intelligent than us or we found you know, specific examples of the possibility of the development of life, now it makes us feel so insignificant because we know how vast space is. And now that we've discovered life here, we know now like we, our existence is, is almost futile in a way. And then you look at the completely opposite spectrum of if we truly are alone, then that also, that also reiterates um, our responsibility as humans here on earth because we look at think of issues of sustainability and climate change and global warming if we truly are alone and all these devastating impacts that we've been making on the earth that we have, this one earth that's the only place in this vast universe that holds life, now it makes this earth so much more valuable to actually know that and realize that this is the only planet that has this uniqueness makes it so much more special. And so I think both sides of the spectrum just to reiterate our responsibility as humans to do better, to be better, um, and to have a better understanding and respect for each other, respect for our planet, to appreciate everything that we have and find ways that we could be able to lengthen the existence of our life and our civilization here on this planet. So that's really where my mind goes through in that philosophical sense of really knowing that we need to do better. And that's why it's so important to travel space and to study and research and send, uh, and send probes out on Mars and send rovers on Mars and look for life on other planets because it's more of so a reminder of us of what we need to do in order to be able to sustain our lives here on earth. Love it, man. And I just want to uh, make a quick note that uh, both uh, again, Maynard and Graham are going to do some awesome stuff for us on stardom. Uh, we have some cool stuff coming up. Uh, I think I'm going to go to you and then Jason, I'm going to, I want to end with you as someone that's truly, I mean, in like really, really in this. And I can't wait to hear what you want to say, but a thing I want to give you first. 
Yeah. So my final thoughts are just this whole conversation has been so incredible, but it really shows how important it is that we not only continue the research, but continue the advocacy and talking about this and communicating it to the public. Um, because whether or not we find life beyond Earth and it's different than who we are or it's almost an extension of who we are, I think it's so important to know that, you know, I, I do believe there's life beyond Earth. And I think that um, coming together collectively, um, you know, as Mayo was saying, as Lou Mayo was saying, like this consciousness, this collective consciousness, just rising that up um, as humanity, as conscious beings in the universe is um, really where it's at. You know, I kind of feel like that's a big purpose of life. And so I think that this conversation has been so real and so and, awesome. Uh, and, I'm so I, and we appreciate you being here. <laughs> uh, so Jason, uh, I mean, you are you are so in it. It's so much to you, and uh, we I, and what I, I appreciate you being on. I mean, it was so quick for both you and Professor Mayo to be here and join us. And uh, I want to hear your thoughts, man, about what you're doing. I mean, this is this is something that you. Whenever we talked about this earlier, you're not someone that is directly out in front of people, but you're so passionate, and you honestly, I'll tell you right now, please, please be in front of the camera more. Um, we need more of you and you love this. And this is really something you're passionate about. And uh, we're going to wrap up with you. Oh, so I'm, I'm happy to speak, but of course there's a reason we have professional communicators is that they're really good at it. And I'm happy to, to speak when I can, or certainly give them the data and help them understand how to communicate that data. So um, now the question is, are we alone in the universe? And um, it's possible. It's also possible that uh, we're not alone, but extraterrestrial life is so distant or so subtle, we'll never spot it, and that's depressing. The only thing that's more depressing than that is not seeing it because we never look. And so if you don't look, you never find it. So we have to keep the search, keep looking at different ways to find life, keep expanding what we know about life by studying life on Earth and chemistry and geology to understand the context of how life forms on Earth and hopefully elsewhere. Thank you. That was beautiful. And uh, for me, just to wrap up, holy hell, I cannot believe what this week has been. And you all are <laughs> so amazing um, to start this week with, um, you know, last Sunday with the team from SLU and to run through all of this with the people that I've been able to talk to, the conversations I've been able to have, what I am so privileged to be a part of because – I look around every single time I look around a room like this, a virtual room like this. I am honored to be around you. I am so thrilled that you all take the time to come in and have conversations like this. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I have to do one thing as we wrap this up. And uh, I appreciate you all. And I am going to go probably to sleep for like the next 36 hours or so before I go back to work. Um, but there's no way we could not finish without something as great as this. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Carl Sagan. This is a place where I often work in Ithaca, New York, near Cornell University. Maybe you can hear in the background a 200-foot uh, waterfall which uh, is probably, I would guess, a rarity on Mars. I don't know why you're on Mars. Maybe you're there because we recognized we have to carefully move small asteroids around to avert the possibility of one impacting the Earth with catastrophic consequences, and while we're up in near-Earth space, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to Mars. Maybe we're on Mars because we recognize that if there are human communities in many worlds, the chances of us being rendered extinct by some catastrophe on one world is, uh, is much less. Or maybe we're on Mars because we have to be because there is a deep nomadic impulse built into us by the evolutionary process. We come, after all, from hunter-gatherers and from 99.9% .9 of our tenure on Earth. 
we've been wanderers and uh, the next place to wander to is Mars. But whatever the reason you're on Mars is, I'm glad you're there and I wish I was with you. Carl, my man. Uh, the best way to end tonight. Thank you all. I appreciate you. And uh, can't wait for next week. We're going to work on it. I'm going to sleep for a while. Uh, appreciate and love you all. And we will see you all soon. And don't, for and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and give lots of money to them because we love OPT telescopes. We'll see you all soon.